Welcome to Thursday here at the Hymns Global Conference, and it has been an astounding four or five days, depending on how long you've been on the ground here in Orlando. Some of the big themes that have been crisscrossing has been the use of innovation. The Innovation Center has been absolutely packed, and people have been really talking about this incredible blend of the large provider booths and capabilities have been brought forward, of the market suppliers, the innovation of the smaller folks that are bringing in new ideas and thoughts, and how all of it has been tied together through the use of information. This year has been an incredible exchange of ideas from a global standpoint. People and individuals and organizations have really been caught in corners talking about the future of the health ecosystem and where it needs to go. And what are the opportunities as HIMSS members to exchange ideas throughout the entire year? One of the other big trends this year in the use of secure information, as well as in the use of blockchain and AI, is how do we do so against the new rules to ensure interoperability and the ability from an operational standpoint to exchange data at an unprecedented level. Without question, there is both a level of optimism, excitement, and anticipation about the next few years as we're feeling the ecosystem change dramatically. And we're looking forward to tomorrow where we're going to be bringing forward HIMSS new brand and logo, which we hope will support what we see as an amazing reformation of health across the entire ecosystem. So as we come into the glide over the last day of HIMSS, I want to thank everyone for being here and we look forward to an incredible finish. Day three, everyone, at HIMSS 19, and the party has definitely started. My name is Kate Milliken, and we will be spending the next few hours interviewing a range of troubadours in healthcare who are making a difference. Before we start, let's hear some words from Ben Choder, president of West DMS. Thank you, Kate. Welcome back to our final day of HIMSS TV, powered by West, live from HIMSS 19 in Orlando, Florida. The innovation theme continues, and you'll be hearing more on AI, machine learning, and blockchain, and how these technologies are transforming healthcare. Enjoy the show. I'm here now with Steve Rettling, who is the CIO and CTO of HIMSS. Steve, I'm so happy to have you here. Arguably, you're going to be busy this week. Um, and <laughs> 
And uh, I want to know and kind of kick off our talk by talking about what you're excited about on the technology front here at HIMSS 19. There's so much going on at HIMSS, and there's really been a turn, I believe, in the technology area of really trying to understand how technology ties into the processes and to the patient. There's definitely a focus on the consumer and a shift. Mm -hmm. You can clearly see that. And a lot more engaging technology that ties into behavior and how to incent behavior mm -hmm. for um, healthy changes. It's been interesting seeing how people are talking about, um, you know, making this kind of a more consumer economy per se, you know, right. which um, I think has been more clear in other industries, right? Yes. Yeah, other industries, we see a lot of translation that's occurring, um, and it's really driven by consumer demand. I mean, we all can relate to it, but uh, there's, you know, the ability to get your groceries, uh, order your groceries online, uh, connect to your family through FaceTime, other things like that are starting to translate into the care process. And so um, what's great about it is um, there's a, a big change afoot and also the acceptance, right, from a millennial perspective of using the technology in a greater rate of adoption is starting to occur. On a systematic level, I think one of the challenges that we've heard about over and over is interoperability. And you are hosting a town hall on the subject. Yes, we uh, are. I'm very glad to hear that. So now I can ask you, are we making headway? Yeah, we are, and we're actually, uh, we have two town halls, one focused on patient and one more focused on the progress side of the coin. And um, yeah, we've, I think there has been a lot of focus on the technical parts of interoperability, mm -hmm. but it's really- Which is, ha you've had to do. We've had we've had to do that, it's fundamental. But there's, there's also the other components around policy and social and other components of process that are part of interoperability that are really important. And when that is evidenced in who's actually showing up to our town halls, see with Commonwealth, Argonaut, and then the CDC. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited about these town halls. Um, they're going to be great. I'm looking forward to them. One of the things that um, Hal Wolf, when we spoke to him um, earlier, spoke about was kind of if you had to take kind of a buzzword, it would be about data. Yeah. And one thing that I have learned um, in this role is, you know, I think as a patient, you think, oh my gosh, the world is opening up and gosh, these doctors are getting so much data about me and now they have 14,000 yeah. points of who I am and right. how that's actually a negative yeah. because it's too much. Yeah. So I want to ask you about APIs, which seem to be a solution that would actually pull from this data and get get people yeah. what they need. Where are we with them? Well, and I'll just say with the data, the, the sure. challenge with the data is it, um, it is all over the place. There's silos of data in every health system. Um, they, they get buried uh, that can be structured or non-structured data. And I think that's really the future of digital medicine is really opening that up. Yep. And APIs are the promise of that as we organize that data behind the scenes across hospitals, et cetera, for a patient. APIs, we are making progress, EHR to EHR APIs, um, especially on the access front, being able to access that data, and starting to look at uh, more specific use cases of how the data is used beyond just the basic patient summary. So that's really exciting around how it can be applied, uh, which is where we're going to be shifting to going forward is more than just access, but how is that data going to be applied as well as the opportunity to be able to write back into the record to share data from that perspective as well. Like to actually garner an insight from the data you collect and put it back into uh, EHR or That's right. a, a report. Because EHRs, when they came into the world, right, it was um, tough for a lot of reasons. And my understanding of EHR is that they've actually been so structured that it's been really hard to pull data from yeah. them, or APIs. Well, I think originally that the EHRs were not designed to share data. They were designed to provide the function for the clinicians in those settings. Over time, we have seen those platforms open up. And they have made a concerted effort, not only for the, the use of the health system, but to start to apply other technology into the processes. So um, that's a work in progress, but I do see a good amount of progress happening and continuing in that area. It's great, and I'm sure actually you have your eye on everything, so I believe you. <laughs> um, and what about AI? Because I feel like that's a buzzword that, um, yeah. you know, curious about the truth in that in healthcare. 
Well, like, I mean, we uh, a AI is upon us, um, and uh, you know, essentially, AI is basically taking statistical methods and applying them to understand trends, be able to provide better recommendations. And so, um, essentially, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Chang, who opened up the interoperability showcase, mm -hmm. talked to us uh, talked to us about uh, machine intelligence equals um, med medical intelligence, and so that uh, uh, machine intelligence plus human intelligence equals medical intelligence. And so the ability to, um, for AI to be successful, again back to the silos, is really important and based off of how well we can access the data and organize the data and understand that data. Um, right now, what we're seeing is uh, the ability to augment decision making for clinicians, not necessarily replace, yeah. but to improve the accuracy with a combined physician an AI algorithm approach. Right, and AI is going to scale and get faster and faster, and the human intelligence, you know, there may in the future be a disconnect, but that may not happen until him's 21. Yeah. You yeah. know, so it's not a well, problem right now, right? Yeah, this, the, yeah, there's a lot of talk about the singularity, right, of when, when that's going to occur, and I think it, um, it's really unclear. Uh, machines certainly can process very fast, but it's all dependent upon us as humans being to put the models in place, yeah. and more importantly, focusing on how can we leverage the technology along with the human process. Hello, I'm Stephen Wellman with Hims TV. I'm here today with Nancy Green from Verizon. Nancy, thank you for joining us. Oh, you're welcome, thank you. Nancy, we're standing outside the Women in Health IT Roundtable here at HIMSS 19. I know you were here on the Roundtable last year as a speaker. Uh, could you tell us what has changed for women in healthcare IT in the last year? How have things gotten better? I think so. So um, there's a couple examples. So all I've been able to do or all I can talk to is really, I spend most of my time with C-levels in our clients. And as they read about what we're doing in Women in Health IT at HIMSS and through conversations, I have men always asking how can they support more of their women? How can they push them and, and how can we get more involved? But I think even last night at the reception that we had, we started this, I think, in 2016, there was a couple hundred people. Last night, there were, I think, over 800 people last night. And it was men and women. It's very inclusive. And I think that's the, the difference is that the, the message getting out and it's very inclusive. Very interesting and very good news to hear. Uh, following up on that, have you seen any initiatives around gender equality that, that work, right? Gender equality in the workplace? And if so, where? Yeah, so again, I'll, I'll talk about Verizon because the, um, I do know that. And, and so for us, it's been um, one of inclusive uh, and you know, not just gender diversity, it's not just gender, it's really everything. And as we work towards that, I think you know, one of our one of the things that we like to talk about is our board uh, of 12 members, seven of them are women or people of color. So we really focus on it. Um, there's a couple different groups within Verizon as well that focus around women and different employee groups that are employee led that um, are in different areas of the company to provide education and, and uh, support. Great, and just following up on that, there's been a lot of discussion about gender diversity, not just here at the WIT Roundtable, but across HIMSS 19. What are your thoughts around being able to expand that conversation to topics like race or gender identity or socioeconomic equality? Well, it needs to be because it's not just race, it's not just age, it's not just women, it's it's everything. So that's where the inclusive comes from. It's important to be that um, that uh, the, the organization or the group that, that reaches out. Um, within Verizon, we have employee, like as I said, employee-led groups that um, really focus on those particular areas to help foster those relationships within an organization and then reach out to the community. Great. Thank you so much for your uh, thoughts and your uh, sharing with us today, Nancy. This is Stephen Wellman with Hims TV. Thank you for watching. With me now is Ashima Gupta, who is the Director of Global Healthcare Solutions for the Google Cloud. Ashima, welcome to the show. Um, we've heard about your new product, and I'm curious for you, um, with the cloud, what do you see as some of the biggest barriers? Thank you for, first of all, truly an honor to be here. Thanks. Uh, leading the change in the cloud and healthcare. From where I sit, we work with a lot of industry, broad spectrum of stakeholders. I see two barriers that are preventing people. Number one is um, the cloud is not a tactical solution. It's truly, it's a holistic strategy. Mm -hmm. So when people think of it, okay, it's lift and shift, it's really truly not that. Mm -hmm. It's truly about business transformation and getting that buy in the strategy, creating that strategy is the number one step. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second barrier that I see is uh, 
really skills. Most of the IT systems that exist today, they go back decades. Mm -hmm. And they were right for that time. If you look into the healthcare, it was designed by, you know, when people needed care, they went into the clinic, you wanted to see the doctor, you went to, you booked an appointment, you went to the ER. So all the systems were designed where patient was actually in, within the four walls. Mm -hmm. It's no longer the paradigm today. Right. With digital health, it's care where you are. Right. It it's, meets the patient where you are. Yes, it's remote monitoring, it's telehealth. Now, how do you deliver that? And the systems, which are very monolithic, they've been put together and they've been trying to be more digital, but digital transformation is truly, you, know, you have to look into the foundation yeah. and, and modernize it. So that holistic strategy requires a very different conversation than, oh, I need Sure. I lift and shift and need better compute. The second is the, as I was touching the people part, we really need to upskill mm -hmm. and broaden the skill set. Mm -hmm. uh, the teams that are in place are very comfortable with man managing an on-premise kind of a data center. The applications are monolithic and it works. Yeah. Cloud is a very different paradigm and you kind of lose a little bit of a control, but you also gain a lot of advantage in security and compliance. And, and, and those conversations need to happen. Sure. So how do you think the thinking has changed of healthcare companies about the cloud in the past two years? So when I, uh, when I started, the conversation was why cloud? Mm. Like uh, it's too dangerous? No, it's uh, privacy concerns, yeah, things like that. Data, security, right. oh, I, I, you know, we don't want to be in. And there was Put a, it as somewhere else might be a problem. Yeah, we don't want to be seen wearing orange jumpsuits uh -huh. like if the data is compromised, right. right? So now they get it, the cloud is secure. We So Google Cloud is an example. We signed HIPAA, mm -hmm. the BA, Business Associate Agreement. Yeah. It's HIPAA compliant, three dozen of our product, uh, products are, and we are continuing to invest in that. So that conversation about cloud being less secure yep. is completely, I think that has been addressed. But now the conversation has changed into how. Fine, I, I get it, cloud is there, and I really want to do transformation. And mind you, this is not IT transformation alone. That's a mistake. It's business transformation, and cloud as a tool, technology. So now they're looking as to how do I go about it? Do I have the right skill set? Do I have the right partners who can help me? It's changing the way business is done. And a whole paradigm shift. It's a whole paradigm shift. Right. It's, it's cloud is an enabler of new business solution, new digital solution. So. It's, an, it's not just part of IT strategy, it's truly your business strategy, so how do you compete? Right. So why is focusing on the strategic and practical applications of AI and machine learning um, at this point too important to ignore for business decision makers? So AI and machine learning, at the end, regardless of the industry you're in, I see it across many different industries, banking, retail, People have data, they have silos, they have fragmented systems. Now, healthcare specifically is data rich, information poor. So now, how do you get the insights out of that data? And, and that's where AI machine learning comes in. Machine learning at its very core is pattern recognition. It's seeing what is there in the data, identifying the patterns, identifying the anomalies, yeah. and, and let that guide your, your business decision. So Google is an AI first company. We believe we have the tools that can help with that pattern recognition. And, and the, the mountains of data that have been sitting in, how do you get insight? So, and, and, you can't ignore it. Right. But also, it's not like AI, I say that with a chuckle, it's not a pixie dust as well, that, oh, yes. I'm going to sprinkle pixie dust and already I'm AI enabled. It's a very thoughtful approach. Right. You need to have data, you need to write data, write right. data labeling, and then build AI expertise, and you can't ignore it. You need right. insights. Right. Right. So what do you feel like the cloud can help us do um, that was impossible before? So cloud can do two things, right? We are speaking, especially um, the work that we are doing in Google Cloud Healthcare is teaching cloud to speak language of healthcare. Mm -hmm. so healthcare has HL7, Fires, Diacom, so, and common delimited files. and So we are now giving it a common place where you can host that data. Yeah. And, and the data silos that have existed Cloud's aim is to really do be that layer that brings the data together yep. and do cross-modality analytics. And I'll give you an example. Sure. 
uh, as an, uh, let's say if you are a female age 45 to 60, um, or if you are a system or a doctor or physician, you're looking into population level approach, right. and you're looking into uh, identifying a population of female 45 to 60 who have had um, a mammogram done maybe three or four years ago, but they have their biomarkers like BRCA1 and BRCA2, and then they haven't seen their doctor in two years. So today, if you have to do that, that a very simple query, you don't have tools for that right. because your healthcare data is in your EHR system, mm -hmm. HL7, and in, in, in that your imaging, it lives in your PAC systems, your gen genomics data, and not all of us have even genome sequence, but let's say if you have, it's a very different uh, data bank, and then your membership system, your health plan information is completely different. Right. How do you combine that? Right. So cloud becomes that natural way where we we can really do this data consolidation, do cross-modality analytics. Yes. And then on top of that, it becomes a gateway to AI machine learning. Uh -huh. So so if you want to do AI machine Because you get the whole scale of enough data that right. you can really start using that data to procure right. insights and kind of um, exactly. you know, get smarter. Right, it gives you the scale, it gives you the tooling, right. and it gives you that cloud-based infrastructure. Right. If, and then other thing is uh, innovation. Right? The, the barrier to innovation has been substantially lowered with cloud. Yeah. If you want to innovate today, the same infrastructure that is available to any Google engineer yeah. is now available to anyone working for any hospital IT system, a startup, a partner. That's a democratization which didn't exist before. But do those innovations actually make it, do you think, easier for decision makers to make riskier decisions? So, Absolutely. As I said, cloud is about really a business transformation strategy. Mm -hmm. And business transformation strategies like small small bets can really lead to big results, but you don't know which bets are going to play out. Right. So you need that experimentation muscle in the enterprise. Right. And how do you build that enterprise muscle? If you have a five-year case and you have to go to your board and the CEO, that it will cost me X tens of millions of dollars, right. and I don't know if it's going to work or not, and then you have this infrastructure sitting there, and same by the way for research. The researchers need something that they can really scale up. Research is over, scale down, yeah. and that experimentation is what you can do today with cloud. And I think for decision makers, yep. it gives them that vehicle to build that experimentation muscle, if yep. you will, to, to build that expertise and, and core competency. So how do you feel that business leaders can better champion the needs of clinicians um, with technology in ways that help uh, the clinician um, and also the performance of the business? Because you've got two separate things almost going on here. A very good question, and I've lived through that when I was at Kaiser. At one point we were bringing in our initiating a project, we were getting the patient-generated data, more like your fitness profile, and we talk about like social determinants of health, your behavior, your sure. lifestyle. Sure. I mean, we say it's important, and it is. Right. But if you've seen an EHR screen, yeah. it's not even showing, right? It doesn't show That's it. That's right. And the doctors don't want to see more data. Yeah. They're saying, give me the insights. Don't give me more data. Don't complicate my already complicated. Well, just to really add it, that in theory, what is clinically proven proven as data that's supposed to tell you something, all the social determinants and uh, factors aren't clinically proven, yet right. they remain important. So how do you find a way of pulling out those insights to give that element to care? Absolutely, yeah. and I think that's where AI and insights, when you are a business decision maker mm -hmm. and you, you want to work with a clinician, you really have to think. Yeah. Two things, A, we talk about taking care of our patients, we need to empower our patients, but how do you do that if you're not empowering people who are taking care of the patients? Yeah, you don't have to get me started. I'm a patient that really believes that you actually, that patients are underestimated in their ability to take control with information. Absolutely. And better their healing, so I know exactly what you mean. And, and then physicians, if you make their life easier, yeah. and you don't give them more data, just okay, now you figured it out, can we make it simpler? That's like we talk about physician burnout. It's, it's a real problem. Yes. After High Tech Act, they have really been, and we talk about that in multiple forums, so that's where AI machine learning comes in, where can I give you meaningful insights, right intervention at the right time. Yep. Yep. Um, so you've been recognized as one of the most implement, uh, influential women in the business. Um, what advice would you give for an entrepreneur who is female who is watching today? 
Uh, first of all, truly an honor yeah. uh, to, to be. Well, hard work makes you influential, so I'm right. just going to give you some credit where it's due. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I've been at it for a It's been a journey. It's, yeah. been, it's a long journey. Uh, the, I have two pieces to say. One is passion with fearless execution. Mm -hmm. You need to do that. And then you find something you're passionate I came from a fintech industry, then I moved to healthcare, and, and I, it resonated with me. It speaks to me. Yeah. So find something that speaks to you, because otherwise you can't do fearless execution. You really need to find that passion. But then passion alone is not enough. The it execution is crucial. Fearless. Yeah. Ah. Take charge. Yes. Fearless execution. I think that's a, that's a great combination. And the second is empower yourself yeah. and but lead with empathy. I think women leaders have this trait. We are more empathetic, so don't let go of that trait. Mm -hmm. But also empower. So don't ask for, can I do this? Take charge, take risks, mm -hmm. take initiatives. So passion with fearless execution. Um, empower yourself, but lead with empathy. Awesome. And, and, and cool. I think that'll serve you well. Awesome. It has served me well, too. I am so <laughs> glad to say that as a fellow entrepreneur, uh, I really appreciate that counsel. Thank you so much for your time, Ashma. Thank you so Thank much. You. Still one of my favorite stories is the incredible work of the folks at Children's Mercy in Kansas City. They deal with some of the sickest um, children uh, in the country. Uh, in particular, we've been working with them around an application called CHAMP, which helps um, babies who are born with hyperplastic left heart syndrome. They're literally born with half a heart, and they have these incredibly complex interventional cardiological procedures in the early stages of their life. Um, and it, yeah, it's kind of hard to really even think about you know a, a tiny baby with a cracked chest um, having these incredible um, procedures. My father actually, um, he's still alive, but when he was practicing as a doctor, was a pediatric cardiologist. When he started practicing, the mortality rate for these conditions was 100%. Uh, now, amazingly, um, through these procedures, they've got it down to the kind of 20 to 30% range. But where AI has really come in has is in its ability to help when the children go home, and the children have to go home in between um, before the final, what they call the Fontaine operation, and they have a relatively high likelihood of mortality because there are a lot of complications that can happen in that time whilst they're at home and growing. Um, and the use of simple technology and simple AI to understand um, what happens to them when they're not in the hospital and to get an early predictor of complications is truly powerful. And we have this beautiful story of this boy called Winston who's now gone through his final um, operation. Um, and he was the first child whose life was saved by the system, the system called CHAMP. And he was at home with his parents. They noticed something wasn't right and they used the capability of um, you know, a simple device at home that was capturing information, capturing videos of Winston at the same point every night, uploading it to the cloud um, so that not only AI but real human beings, it's an augmented thing um, could see that there was a problem they could call him in they could call him in earlier than they would have detected it um, and now the real beauty of, the, of that story not just at a personal level is that they've put this system in nine separate hospitals and so not only do more people get the benefit of the system and more babies who are born with this incredibly difficult condition um, get the benefit but the system gets smarter because the amount of data in it gets greater. And so this combination of the personal connection, but also the systemic benefit that can be created by it just gets me very, very excited about the possibilities. West, technology-enabled solutions that move your communications into the future. Patient engagement solutions that support you in solving the complex communication challenges associated with patient experience, patient care, patient access, and revenue cycle management. Digital media solutions that help you target the right audience, communicate across multiple channels, and monitor the impact of your messages. Visit us in Booth 659. With us now is John Kansky, he's an NBA, CPHIMS, FHIMSS president and CEO of the Indiana Health Information Exchange. John, I'm thrilled to have you here, so Stephen. Um, and we want to talk about interoperability with you. You've been in this industry for a decade. It's something you're really honed in on onto. And in your mind, it's not totally easy. So tell me what you mean. 
Well, uh, there's interoperability is something that at every level of the industry has gotten a lot more attention. The federal government's paying attention to interoperability. The EHR vendors are improving their interoperability capabilities. The health information exchanges, we feel as if we've been in the interoperability business for decades right. and continue to be. Uh, the, the, the challenge is, is that um, there's sort of a, a very simplified view of the interoperability uh, puzzle right now. Um, and I just think that um, interoperability isn't just one thing. It's not as simple as uh, a physician being able to get uh, information on the patient that's in front of them from another enterprise. What about population health? What about um, notifications of clinical events? What about um, quality measurement? So um, I don't think anybody would be satisfied with interoperability if all we could do is move one patient's data from here to there. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, from, and Stephen, maybe you can weigh in on this, that um, when you think about what the patient experience is, you know, kind of what you said, of making sure you take your medication, uh, actually um, being able to find doctors that you like, and putting it all together, so. Yeah, I mean, patient engagement, right? Right. Is mirroring this trend that we've seen in the consumer world of customer centricity, right, patient centricity, and creating an environment where it's not only uh, re reminding the patient to take their medicine, reminding the patient that they need to do a particular activity, but creating a frictionless environment that is in some sense delightful, right? Or at least much easier than it would be under a traditional clinical model. Yeah. And so I just see, I think you see that kind of Amazonification, right, of healthcare coming through, and data is the key to that, right? Interoperable, interoperability and data together. I mean, well, the way and the that. federal government is really bringing the patient into their view of interoperability, and in, 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 uh, the HIEs welcome that. I, I think uh, the challenge is always making sure that the information to treat the patient is available, period. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the uh, patient comes equipped with their information, great. If the HIEs can bring the information to, to the clinician, right place, yeah. that's great. If the EHR vendor enables interoperability with the with the HIE or with the with the other EHRs, that's great. We're, we're doing that's why it does get complicated. Yeah. But I think it's this is kind of the way we do things in America is we try a bunch of stuff, yeah. uh, and in the end it works. And I think we're on that path uh, with a long way to go um, to figuring out how to make something that works that's going to be a little bit more complicated than some people probably believe at this date. In your opinion, in, in light of what Steven said about the Amazonification of giant healthcare systems, do you believe that you know, uh, systems making those acquisitions will help with the problem of interoperability, or do they still have the same issue? They uh, come at it with a completely different set of assets, right? I mean, uh, they have giant platforms that um, could be and should be useful uh, in, in healthcare. Um, how they um, uh, figure out how to apply those to solve a problem of interoperability, I'm deliberately saying a problem of interoperability because no one player in this space can just, uh, that's kind of the point about it being a lot of things. Yeah, right. But if, uh, if they help uh, the patient walk in the door with their data, and that helps with clinical decision support. It's better for the patient. In the That's country. a good thing. Great. John, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Yeah. If we take the personal part, I think a lot of doctors' time is spent on the computer, especially when they're with a patient in a room, and I think that's um, sort of a violation of our trust. So I think a computer and a machine, if it's smart, will enable the doctor to get back into a more one-on-one -on -one relationship with the patient because a lot of the work, um, documentation, and decision-making will be taken out of the doctor's hands, at least uh, when the doctor's in the room with the patient. And I think it will be, at the same time, more personalized because we'll be practicing a much higher level of precision medicine so that patients will be getting a different treatment, even with the same medical condition, because it's more uh, precision medicine. With us now is Blaine Newton, who is the Executive Vice President of HIMSS Analytics, and Dr. Ann Snowden, who is the Scientific Director and CEO of Scan Health. Hello, you two. Thank you so Hello. much for joining us. Hello. I know HIMSS Analytics has a number of different initiatives, and one of the frameworks that they have been working on is something uh, called the HSIM. So why don't you kick this off by telling us what that is? Sure. Uh, so the HSIM Health and Supply Information Maturity Model is the latest um, uh, 
maturity model that we brought into our larger portfolio uh, of maturity models that started with MRAM, so an EMR adoption model. Mm -hmm. And those frameworks and models are really intended to help guide uh, healthcare providers and health systems and public health agencies around the world um, understand kind of the steps it takes to leverage technology to improve outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, the, we recognize after doing a, a fair amount of research with the provider community that operational performance, uh, financial optimization, system op optimization is a top priority for providers. So, so before you can get to the true clinical outcome improvement, you need to kind of optimize what you have and, and, and extract value out of the significant investments that have been made. Uh, and, and, and we're just not there yet. And so we see uh, the HSIM model, which Ann Snowden uh, built, for, built uh, through years of research, and she'll explain in a little bit, as a way for us to capture the value uh, and, and optimize the infrastructure that's been built over the last decade in healthcare through the EMR adoption. And really it's focused on clinically integrated supply chain and the opportunities that come from that, that linkage of supply chain systems and clinical systems. Uh, and, and we're incredibly excited about it. There's been a lot of uh, buzz uh, and conversations around it on the floor. I think it has the opportunity to truly change healthcare. Very interesting, like what drove this, uh, this drive to improve the supply chain? For providers, has this emerged as a recent challenge? I know it's always been there, but, but sort of why has this now come to the forefront? So it's a good question. It, it's actually a recent solution to a challenge we've had in global health systems for decades. And the primary driver for me as a nurse mm -hmm. is medical error. Mm -hmm. So when you go into a hospital setting or a clinic as a citizen, you expect and hope to get the very best care possible. But the truth is, there's really no global health system in the world that tracks and traces every patient, every care procedure, every product used in care, and maps it to an outcome to know what's working best and for whom. Yeah. Hmm. That's what the HSIM tool does. So how does that help us with medical error? Well, some of our medical errors are pretty challenging. Yeah. If we put a hip implant in that joint because you've fallen and broken that hip, how do we know that hip implant has been recalled? We don't. Wow. Unless you track and trace every patient, every care process, every product we use in care to an outcome, we don't know who does very, very well with that hip surgery, who doesn't do very well, and how does the health system learn from that real world data? What we have been relying on is clinical trial data. So all our wonderful clinicians, researchers, run clinical trials right. and say, guess what? That's the best surgery for you, and this is the prosthesis we're going to use. Wow. We know one size doesn't fit all in healthcare. Right. We know that women respond differently in certain care scenarios than men. We know indigenous people have different outcomes than Caucasian people. Until you have an infrastructure in a healthcare system that can track and trace what care is received by whom, and did it work really well or maybe not as well, then health systems can't learn what works best for whom and under what conditions. This HSIM tool creates that possibility. Wow. So it allows us to overcome big challenges like error, but also quality, safety, and making the best decision for every individual citizen. I love the fact, first of all, that you come from a nurse background and you have created this, right, or spearheaded it. You know, we had a previous interview with somebody who was talking about the power of Infram yeah. and really going into it and how it almost became like a checklist, yeah. right? Yeah. By going through it, they were able to recommend to their clients, um, there are things that you have to get rid of or we recommend that you buy this. And initially, the reaction was, are you crazy? Yeah. Um, but in that conversation, it became so clear that more and more, Right. Um, it became evident that that was real, right? That yeah. those are, and it seems like HSIMS has the possibility of potentially becoming almost like that checklist. Right. Yeah. So, and it actually takes you beyond the checklist. Yes. So if you know what care is working best for whom, and in what country, like how come each country isn't learning from the other countries on their great outcomes? So right now we've taken all the joint registry data from England, mm -hmm and we're comparing it to Canada. We're gonna soon add the US and the Australian data. So we can start to understand if you're between 85 and 95 and you have the following health history, what's the best care, surgical care for you and which one's got the best outcomes so that you can go home and live independently. 
why can't we learn health system to health system? Because we all are in the same boat. We all have way more patients than we can deliver care to. Yeah. We're spending way more money than our country's GDP is generating. Right. And wasting some and, of it. And, and lots of waste. As soon as you implement a, uh, a, a clinically integrated supply chain, in the three countries who have done it, your supplies cost drops by 30%. Wow. I've never seen an innovation create that outcome. Their labor cost, which is probably more important, drops 33% because it makes our environments easier for clinicians to work in. So as a nurse, when I give you a medication, the clinically integrated supply chain double checks for me, it's the right drug, right dose, right time, right patient, and the right route to give it in. I never had that as a nurse. Yeah. Wow. So this is solving challenges for our clinicians, making it easier for them to give excellent care and making sure every citizen knows exactly what care we gave them so they can make good decisions on the basis of what's right for them. Not what a clinical trial says, which is great, but I may not be that clinical trial patient of yours. I'll tell you what, I need to make that happen. So it really engages the patient citizen much, much more directly. Wow. There's a couple of big things that, that, that Anne just highlighted. Uh, in terms of the efficiency and cost savings gains, just to kind of um, level set that contextually, in the pilot sites that we've worked with around the world in, in Alberta and at Mercy Health in St. Louis and, and in, in the NHS, we're seeing eight to one return on investments early stage in the model. You're seeing, and that, that translates to hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars uh, for those systems that can be reinvested in consumer-centric care. Uh, and it, it's such a powerful story. The other uh, thing that this highlights, that Ann highlights here, is really a, a fundamental shift for Hims Analytics and moving beyond just adoption and use to outcomes. So getting to the why here, so understanding why this is important. There's a lot of really cool things happening on that floor and it's helping to understand the impact that those can have in the right circumstance, in the right process with the right people. And HSIM is really our, our uh, opportunity to tell that story in a very impactful, powerful way globally. Wow. Stephen, I mean, in your world, is that impressive? Because for a layman, I think that's awesome. <laughs> it's very impressive. I mean, certainly I've never heard the kinds of returns in a supply chain implementation no, in a true. traditional, more broad, horizontal environment in IT yielding that kind of result. Right. I mean, the other question I have is, do you expect that kind of return to continue as, yes. as the model is rolled out globally? Yep. Right? Um, or will it begin to either will accelerate further or potentially slow down as it hits other markets or as markets perhaps mature? Right? Yeah. right? Perhaps as you begin to enter markets with more, you know, hospitals that are much more advanced state, whether it's in MRAM 7 or whatever, yeah. or 6, uh, will that begin to impact or will it begin to lower the amount of returns that you see here or will it have no impact at all? So that's a good question. It's often the thinking that, oh, well, it's great to save that much, but so what happens next? Hmm. We have data from 10 North American hospitals. That 30% cost savings just on supplies is annualized. So every year, that CFO is achieving a 30% savings to reinvest, which allows you to scale it. Here's what we haven't measured yet. What's the cost savings of avoiding a near catastrophic or life-ending error, right? right? If I, as a nurse, can make sure I never give the wrong medication, and then we actually calculate the avoidance of error mm -hmm. and the cost that brings, then the numbers are much more likely to be greater than 30%. How big? We don't know. Error today is the third leading cause of death in North America, in healthcare. So if we removed even half of that error in North America, at that end point where we have this clinically integrated supply chain, that's a very big number. And that's what I'm after. Wow. Remove the error. And oh, by the way, you get great cost savings, much better quality, and every citizen can feel very confident in that healthcare system. And for me, that's the value. And I get the impression you're probably not going to stop till you no. get it. No. So <laughs> that's going to work out well. I'm just getting warmed good, up. Good. Actually. I love it. Well, we're so glad to have you on the show. On the show with such a moment Thank of triumph so to report. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Right on. Hi, I'm Laura Lovett, and I'm here with Stacy Selekis. And we're going to be talking a little bit about women in health IT. So could you introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about what you do? Sure. So I'm Stacey Tzleckis. I am a partner with Grant Thornton. 
I lead currently our Department for Veterans Affairs account. It's one of our largest accounts in the firm today. And I've been consulting for about 25 years and started um, in the healthcare industry doing some analytics for a, a healthcare consulting firm. And one of the things that came up in our roundtable today was talking a little bit about opportunities for women. We were talking about the digital space, so maybe you could tell me a little bit about where you see opportunities for women in the future. Sure. Um, I think the digital space presents a, a good opportunity for women because just the nature of the digital space uh, requires new ways of doing business, new business models, new organizational models, which I, I, I think presents opportunities for women to be in a lot of different leadership roles, to be in the collaboration that's required for digital success. Uh, so I do think there's opportunities. I think one of the areas where there still needs to be focus and deliberate um, action is in the harder technical skills that also form that foundation um, for women starting very young to get the training in those skills as well. And one of the other things we touched on was mentorship. Could you talk to me a little bit about where you see that role in kind of bringing women up and, and promoting women? I think mentorship is incredibly important by women and men for women in the workforce. Um, you know, a lot of women will have very different experiences as they try to engage and move forward and progress within the organizational environments. And mentors are incredibly valuable for the kind of feedback and the support you need. And it's mentors that are senior to you, it is mentors that are peer to you. Um, and we've even started a reverse mentoring at, at Grant Thornton to learn from people who have more knowledge and skills of the, the, newer, the newer economies and the newer technologies. So I, I do think it's a vital um, to being able to progress. And where do you think the conversation is going in the next, you know, one to five years in terms of women in the health IT space? I think the conversation is going to orient to inclusion, um, not, not just in health IT, but everywhere. We've talked a lot about diversity. Sometimes that becomes a numbers game. Uh, I, I think it's going to orient more toward what does inclusion look like and what is the value of inclusion. You know, we, we all know, we, or there seems to be a lot of um, information out there about the value of having a diverse workforce that can bring the different experiences, um, especially in something like healthcare where you have such a diverse consumer base, right, that it actually provides value to the market. And I think that is the, def the direction we will go toward value and toward inclusion. With me now is Michael Regan, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Information and Innovation Officer for Centera, and Dan Bowden, who is the Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer of Centera. Hi guys, you guys have been busy. Tell me what you've been putting out there at this conference. I think this year is an interesting year for Centera. We actually have uh, sponsored and put a booth in the Innovation Live Lab. We're talking about three main initiatives that we've developed there. The first is we've built a blockchain-based platform for uh, Internet of Things uh, device management and security. We've been talking about, uh, second thing is talking about uh, an information security program offering for medium and small health systems. And then talking about an also a, a public cloud-based platform that we, we developed first for our new digital and mobile applications and strategy, and also for uh, a future uh, potential platform that all of our health system applications could be staged from. So how do you two feel, having been in kind of the security business, how much is it ramped up in terms of people paying attention to the issue? Well, I think it. I think it's front and center. It's a. It's a central issue now. Um, you know, you really can't be good at practicing IT if you're not thinking of security first. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you know we we like to say Dan and I say security is a team sport. Ha. Huh. Um
Um, it was funny, we had an interview earlier where someone actually called security a matter of life and death, and then went on to paint an argument that if you're starting to interconnect medical devices and you get a hacker, you know, playing with your heart yeah. who has an IP address, how does mm -hmm. that play out? Do you well, think it's, it's important, and if you look at just recent things that happened the past couple of years, um, the Health and Human Services and the, the healthcare industry cybersecurity task force published a report, and it basically said cybersecurity is a health concern, mm -hmm. very much to your point. And so there's been a lot of focus the last couple of years in understanding and making all of healthcare more resilient and communicating more about how do we manage our assets on the network, um, what are these devices, how do they work, what functionality do they have, and how can we better secure them at multiple layers, either at the device or at the network layer, right. in order to, to make sure that, one, they're performing as needed to support clinical use, but two, uh, we're protecting patients appropriately as well. It's funny because I, from what I understand in the early days when people were starting to talk about EHRs and putting information and data into the cloud, there was such a worry about the security in the cloud. And it seems like because so much data has gone into that, that the cloud in itself are offering better security systems than the providers. Got a comment on that? You know, I, I think I think that you, I think it's absolutely true. I think today, you know, when you take a look at, at public cloud security systems and really how you how you do that, uh, you absolutely get a better security profile there. But I think it has to do a little bit more with the um, move to cloud and really how you kind of design and architect your cloud. So, if you think about the the transition that you kind of go through there, you get to install the right compliance framework, mm -hmm. the right controls around your applications. Where I think a lot of people in healthcare have kind of inherited, there's been a lot of acquisition, there's been a lot of, of um, rapid growth in healthcare systems, so you have maybe had the opportunity to do that at a local level. So this transition and move to cloud is a very important aspect of really securing your systems. How many people actually uh, get involved with the cloud who don't make the right security decisions? I think that those people today sort of self-select not to move to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And What's the breakdown on providers in the U.S., do you guys know? Well, I, th I think it depends on, you mean as far as moving into the cloud? Yes. It's interesting on how you define that. Okay. I think um, for some organizations, adopting Office 365 is moving into the cloud. Uh -huh. And yeah. it's technically hosted in, in software as a service. Right, that's And fair. so they, they get credit for moving into the cloud. What Mike referred to, this move into public cloud, mm -hmm. we're it's basically all, a -A all of yes. our, we put out. exactly, where we're, we're now moving our applications into the cloud. And as Mike pointed out, um, you need to have another layer of understanding because things work differently. For us, the security tools we use in the cloud are completely separate set of tools from what we use in our data center. So we had to learn new tools, how to deploy those, how to support those. But as Mike pointed out, what was great was we now are building it ourselves from the beginning. Right. So we're implementing good configuration standards, good framework standards, and then any, any exception that is needed to have or needed to be implemented is documented and managed up front, where in the past, we built all these stove type systems, and then we had to make them work together. Right. HL7, DICOM, yep. and we just made them work the best way we could before we were aware of cybersecurity problems. Right. And then the cybersecurity problems came. Well, it was compared actually earlier on today that innovation is like having a uh, water balloon. You squeeze one part of it and it gets <laughs> smaller and the other part falls up and you do this and you, and you do that. Mm -hmm. Um, in the beginning of this conference, I got to interview Hal Wolf, who is the CEO of HIMSS, and he spoke about the fact that people often come into this conference um, with three questions and they come out with six ideas. Do you guys feel in light of where you're at that you're able to gain intel um, outside of all these amazing products you've put out? Um. I mean, I think I think the uh, the in, the intel we're gathering or I'm gathering is a better understanding of what we've built and where we are. Mm -hmm. And I think coming into it, I had an idea, and I was even talking about this as we were coming over here. That my uh, I, in my mind, I was trying to imagine: well, what did we build? Where does it sit relative to? what everyone else is doing. Right. And, uh, and I think that's the, the, uh, the ideas that come out of it, is where are we really? Yeah. And now it refines our ideas 
about where we want to go next. Right. And so I think that's what I come out of. And so I think it's right. That's probably the right, you know, the right um, proportion of, of questions and ideas. But I think for us, it's now what's the next thing right. in each of those three three things we develop. Yeah. Right. I, I would add. I, I think this is a place where partnerships get forged as right. well. I do. So. I do agree. I think there's a real collaborative energy, yeah. and it's really mm -hmm. great to see you guys be part of it. You guys, thank you so much for being part of our show. Thank you. Thank you. So today, a lot of issues regarding your cloud and fears that people have, really rightly so actually, is around data privacy, number one. So it's very important to respect at all costs the PHI of the patient, isn't it? And so we spent a lot of technology around Arteris for the last four or five years to build technology around it to ensure that the PHI will never leave the hospitals while giving to the hospital and the physician the value of their cloud and their compute in the back end. And we've done that in the US, but also in Europe, which is extremely stringent on those questions. Number two, I think, of the cloud is like, this is really great to have a cloud system, but how is that integrated in my workflow? And I think what is very exciting in Arteris is that we can do both. We can really have proven that we can really bring the value of the cloud as well as really making the system fully integrated, FDA cleared, and integrated, and while respecting data privacy. And I think that's a very important piece. And I'm excited to introduce the two of you. Why don't you guys introduce yourself? Uh, Brian Fugere, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer with Veerance Health. <laughs> And I'm Dan Lotsoff. I'm the Chief of Staff for West Digital Media Solutions. Awesome. So you guys have both been in the realm of communications and healthcare for a long time. What do you think um, today, comparatively to years past, has changed and what's been exciting for you in this kind of frontier um, that's been happening? You know, I think what we see as a, as a technology company and provider for um, for digital offices is really it's all about patient engagement now. Mm -hmm. That's the emerging space where people are really focused. There's a ton of money flowing into there, lots of new startups, lots of cool technology, but even the big boys are getting it right. If you look at Epic and their app that is on your phone called MyChart, mm -hmm. it's probably the best patient engagement tool that's out there and they win awards for it. Yeah. All the other companies are like us are trying to catch up, yeah. but it's how do you engage with those patients using multimedia, different um, applications on their phone, Whatever it takes, that's what people are trying to do today. Right. And Dan, do you think you have a concrete example of exactly what you said, how those niches moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, one of the things that we like to focus on is how do you leverage video to improve right. the authenticity and speed of communication. So, for example, we have insurance organizations that are focused on how do they connect with the payer, from mm. the payer to the provider, to educate them on new benefits claims or how to get paid. And so what we allow them to do is instead of sending a person in a car for nine months to reach 17,000 providers in a oh. given state, we'll deliver it through video in one message. So instead of one message take an entire year to deliver it, we can deliver hundreds of messages throughout the year through video. I feel like the realm of video initially used to be so expensive also, and I think people understanding um, how powerful it can be as a medium is really coming around, right, on, yeah, on some level. The other thing is, it's funny to think about what personal engagement is, especially from a communications perspective, because when I hear patient engagement, what I think about is the telling of the personal story of the patient and how powerful reminding people that healthcare is personal through things like video yeah. um, is enormous. Yeah. Can you guys yeah, speak think, to that? Yeah, I think it, it's a great way, uh, it, when you think about patient engagement, it's always from the provider out to the patient. Mm -hmm. That's the initial response. How do I engage them, how do I reach them? But what you're, what you're driving at is the other direction, and how do you remind the provider that it's an individual situation, my personal story, my struggle with the healthcare system, and it, leveraging video for that is a really powerful way to do it, and, and nobody's done that yet. Yeah. yeah, and I think the other reason why it's successful is it's authentic, right? Yeah. Um, you can see the person, you can see the reaction, you can see how they're yeah. you know, having a dialogue and a conversation. That's why this is so much more natural than you know, any one of us just doing a presentation. Right. So, that's why we prefer that. PowerPoint um, by, by way Death of the dodo, right? Yeah. I know. Exactly. Yay! Yeah. Um, I, I really believe that too. So um, do you feel that uh, in, in, you know, another thing that comes up with the realm of dealing with video production and making content from a provider standpoint is HIPAA. How do you guys circumvent that? Well, 
Well, we really don't because you can't. Okay. But it, the, the video content that the providers will use is designed to educate and inspire. And so what we don't want to have happen is a patient ignore something and then a gap in care results. Mm -hmm. And so you want to inspire them to take an action to, to help with their own personal care. The education part is just the natural extension of that. And the video technique is really the most powerful way to do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a perfect example is what we're doing here with HIMSS 19 and HIMSS TV, right? So there's 42, 43,000 people that are here on site. and. <laughs> You know, but there's probably a half a million to a million people that would love to be consuming yeah. this content, and they just mm -hmm. can't be there, right? You can't send everybody from your organization to this no. event, and so hopefully, what we're able to do here is to broadcast this great content yeah. to a much larger audience. Yeah, and I think the whole world of YouTube and general saturation in media. You know, I do commend you guys for finding ways to make that video medium educational, because then you start thinking about what is the value. So for the value for me, when I am looking at video, is if I can find a patient story of someone living with MS who inspires me, I'm engaged, right? Like I'm inspired and it actually sets the, the course of my healing. For you guys to actually um, find ways where you can engage people to be better um, through that content is important because, you know, your biggest danger now with video is that everybody's beginning to do it. Yep. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a big challenge. I mean, I think speed to market is always important, mm -hmm. but I think finding the right size of video is also so snackable content, bite size, uh, not trying to tell the whole story all in one picture is, uh, is important. So that's what we really try and focus on, making it engaging and to your point, a, a two-way conversation. That's right. Mm -hmm. in, in interactive. Yeah. Um, so so at HIMSS, have you guys felt um, something that, I mean, it would be amazing if there were video cameras everywhere. What have you guys seen that you have found um, especially interesting outside of your awesomeness? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think the, um, I, I think that the realization now of all of the big vendors that they can't do it all by themselves, mm -hmm. and you're starting to see the strength of the ecosystem around each one of them. And if you walk around the show, what you'll see is a booth that says, I'm a partner of Epic or Google or wow. Cerner or GE or partner any of. partner of. And so those ecosystems are forming around the main vendors to provide those plugins to help the patients and help the providers get the full solution that they need. Yeah. Yeah. I think in the past, right, you had a bunch of point solutions solving right. individual problems. Yeah. And now this this greater ecosystem is working together to solve you know different challenges that are and the government there. is driving that through their push for interoperability. Yeah. Yeah. And it's smart and it's working. Yeah. That's great. You guys um, please enjoy the rest of your conference. You look great on camera. Thank Just you. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> and uh, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Cool. Thank you. Um, so that's like my personal sweet spot. And actually what I wanted to ask you is, um, when you're seeing all these digital health, uh, startups at Moby Health News, um, are you seeing a lot of them that are using video? Um, absolutely. Um, whether it's live video, so obviously telehealth is a large segment of the digital health uh, initiative and all the efforts, but even custom-made content for individual patients, custom-made content for providers, uh, There's we have some for seniors that can help them learn about or remember their previous days and their memories if they're trying to lose them they're starting to lose those. Uh-huh, I believe that, and I think that's really important to, you know, make the money, I mean, uh, spend the money to do it, and I think that a lot of people, you know, it's cre it has to be creative. Yeah. And I think that's hard for kind of more, um, you know, official and uh, conservative <laughs> or uh, providers or whatever else. It's nice to have variety. Not always, yes, I totally agree. <laughs> Okay, with us now is Andrew Mellon, who is a VP of Medical Informatics, who's also a physician at SureScripts. Um, it's really nice to have you, uh, Andrew, on the show. Um, we've been talking a lot about um, power of the patient and the patient as consumer. And one thing that has certainly come up is the concept of price transparency. Mm. So what insights have you picked up here at Hims about that? Sure, it's been a very important topic for us. We've, uh, through the SureScripts Network Alliance, we have focused on this very heavily for the past, past year. Yesterday I had a panel with a number of representatives from the Alliance, practicing physicians and partners at uh, major health technology vendors and Express Scripts. Yeah. In addition, our CEO was on stage with uh, the chief medical officers of Cigna and uh, CVS today. So everyone's talking about this. And this is really about giving power to the patient and helping them make better choices when they're with their provider. It's about removing a lot of the information asymmetry and allowing the provider to make a choice that's both in the clinical best interest and the economic best interest of that patient 
within the shared decision making uh, framework. And we're still seeing really great results. Yeah. We're seeing things like um, savings of $288 when psychiatrists make medication switches. Mm -hmm. We're seeing, we saw one patient that saved over $8,000 on a prescription simply by understanding that they can get the, the same medication at a different location. Yeah. And we're seeing uh, changes in efficiency. Uh, so removing the need 28% of the time to on a drug with a prior authorization. And let me just uh, um, clarify that you guys have the ability to, if somebody um, has to get a medication, of having the ability to not only say, here's how much it costs, but if you don't like this, um, there may be other opportunities for other modalities for you to do. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, when they, we show that medication, um, there's options presented to the patient and the provider to have that discussion around what the choices are. So, you would think it'd be so, everybody, you know, you would think that that would be something that everybody would do. We, we think so, and we're seeing tremendous adoption. It's the fastest growing service we've ever provided. Yeah. We've grown 1,300% in the past year. Oh my God. So we have over 100,000 <laughs> physicians. Um, you know, do you need to say that, that again? That is just like the best metric <laughs> yeah. we've heard all conference. 1,300% yeah. over the past year. I mean, it's just, everyone is ready to do this. It's. You know, it's one of those things where the physicians are asking us for it. Yeah. It's additional information that they find incredibly valuable. Right, mm -hmm. right. And so, so it's been really exciting. It's great. And in the spirit of removing barriers to data, information for all, interoperability, 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 yeah. what is, from your perspective, is this the year that we're making progress in that space? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's this really interesting confluence of multiple factors. We see the government and other major entities um, really working hard to create a, a, an environment that's demanding the release of this information, demanding the ability for, it to, to, for people to have control over it. Great. Secondarily, we have groups like Care Equality that have come together and removed a lot of the barriers, a lot of the administrative barriers, trust barriers that go into interoperability. Yeah. And the third thing, technologies now that allow the interchange of data. And yeah. At SureScript, one of the things we're offering or helping our customers, our partners with, is this ability to see where that patient has gotten information anywhere in the country. So one of the challenges with, with general sort of inter, information exchanges, you often have to know where their patient's been. And sometimes Which is they so, so helpful to kind of uh, you know, bring it all together and understand the context. That's right. Great. And we can see where they've been anywhere in the country. That's huge. And That's help huge. find that information with their permission. Andrew, thank you so much you. for being on our show. Keep up the metrics. Thanks. It's <laughs> amazing. Here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank great. You. Um, what I think is uh, super awesome about that is that maybe that there's an assumption that if you kind of, you know, open the kimono of understanding uh, every price and what's going on, that people would lose money. Mm -hmm. And what I love is that, you know, they're, they're kind of taking a bet that when you throw it out there and you're honest with people. Yeah. No reason not to. Sunlight's the best medicine. Or the phrase is something along those lines. Yeah, Sunlight like, X, X, X something something. Yeah, right. <laughs> the, uh, the transparency. And it totally you know, empowers the patient, um, mm -hmm. which I think is important. So, Up next, we have Ryan Howells, who's a principal at Levitt Partners. Ryan, um, it's really nice to see you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I am told you do a lot of work with health insurance um, and reforms. And I'm curious about the, the obstacles that you are facing in that domain. Yeah, so um, we actually uh, do some work there, but we also do some work with a group called the Karen Alliance. Mm -hmm. and the Karen Alliance is actually focused on patients getting digital access to their health information. Okay. And so yesterday at HIMSS, Administrator Verma was on stage talking about the rules that dropped on Monday, which were the pretty CMS significant. Rules? That's mm -hmm. right. And so we are focusing on the patient getting digital access to their complete health information, mm -hmm. both clinical and claims information. Um, so we are working with uh, about 50 organizations in the sort of a, a company, including the largest payers and providers in the country, a lot of app vendors and a lot of uh, consumer advocates to make this happen. You know, it's 2019, we're seeing a lot of major shifts in the market and just in their terms of strategy, we're seeing a lot of Amazoning healthcare systems, putting a bunch of services together, pay provider models. What do these types of transitions into new strategies mean and how are they affecting your business? Well, I think that um, what they're all trying to do is trying to find ways to empower the patient with actually the digital tools and the patient-specific health information that is necessary to be able to change the game. Yep. So most of these companies have a real difficult time trying to get access to the data. Um, what we're trying to do is leverage what's called the HIPAA individual right of access 
to be able to um, extract the data outside of HIPAA to a patient's app of their choice and then redirect that information back into um, the HIPAA workflow, so to speak. And what that does is it allows for these third-party apps to then be able to um, access the data much seem more seamlessly than they can today and do it through standards-based means. From your experience, why is it so important that patients get their own data? So it's interesting because most of the people you talk to who don't believe it's important for patients to get access to the data are really healthy and have never had a significant health issue. Wow. Mm. But for those who have had significant health issues or have had loved ones or is a, are caregivers to actually people that have had significant health issues, it's a really big deal to get access to all of your health information because for them it's very personal and it's very real. Um, in fact, um, I just saw that uh, Roger Savino, who runs actually the Office of Civil Rights, which oversees HIPAA for the whole country, wow. just recently had trouble accessing his data. <laughs> Oh, gosh. <laughs> so when that happens, you have a really interesting means by which now they're going to really try to find ways to enforce the individual right of access, yeah. mm -hmm. which is something we've had for 20 years, but before we've had to go to the basement of a hospital, print out you yeah. know, different pages of an EHR. Now we have the ability to extract an API yeah. to a third-party app of their choice, and that allows you to get that information that you need at your fingertips. So we need more data with less friction. Yeah. Right. We actually had an EHR advocate on the show who had a dog that was sick and the dog got sick and then they were getting notifications as he taken his pills and he had this stunning revelation of like there's a major problem here that my dog is getting better care yes. and notifications uh, than right. I am um, and being incentivized and that's sort of case in point you know that as a result of him living that problem right oh it's personal and this is yeah. what yeah. happens when you're sick when you're an entrepreneur you live a problem right you realize there's a major issue right and uh, how do you end up uh, trying to fix it and I think that's fantastic but, but so. it's every it's every area of your life right that's so right. even when you're selecting benefit plans if you have an employer-sponsored health insurance yeah the difficulty in selecting a benefit plan of your 10 years worth of health history yeah. I don't know what to do but yeah. in this way if we have 10 years worth of history at least the the system will be able to recommend a plan that's best for us. Exactly. That's Absolutely. awesome. Well, that is very encouraging, and I really love that story. So thank you for telling it. You're and totally en welcome. Enjoy the rest and of the conference. And if you're interested in more information, it's yeah. karenalliance.com. It's where right. you get more information. So thank you. Good. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. So this has been an unbelievable conference. Uh, I got to go into the exhibition hall yesterday. And, um, you know, I don't know if it's totally clear how crazy these setups are, but it turns out that um, this arena has been up for an entire week, um, and people have been coming in for days to make these exhibition booths. They uh, take about five days to put up. They cost hundreds and thousands of dollars, um, and they often are set up to be kind of a reception place in the day, but actually um, to change their vibe at night. So I found out that there are actually a number of disco balls in the exhibition hall, which means that after five o'clock, um, anything can happen. And uh, yesterday, you know, they have policies on how they want to, um, you know, deal with uh, how much sound people can have. And there was a major problem um, because somebody was breaking the decibel limit. And it turns out someone was using a chainsaw to create an ice sculpture. So hopefully that gives you some perspective of what we're dealing with here and um, how big and enormous it is and how much knowledge there is. And actually we got a tip from somebody that says it's so crazy here at HIMSS that the best way to deal with it is to actually simply pick a niche, dive in and try to stay limited um, because it's so crazy. So. Next up, we now have Jonah Comstock, who uh, also works at Moby Health News. He is the chief editor, and is that right? Yep. Good. Um, <laughs> and uh, with us is Luis Gustavo Kiatake. That's it. Okay, I got it. Good. <laughs> um, you are the president of SBIS Brazil. Um, tell us a little bit about what you do and what's exciting you. All right. So we, we are leading the, the health informatics society in Brazil, and uh, well, we have many challenges over there. Uh, we have some new regulations that uh, have been done in the last
last few days in Brazil, yeah. uh, covering telemedicine, mm -hmm. that we are open the telemedicine uh, practices in Brazil, and there is huge discussion over there. The doctors are complaining a bit about the use of technology, and so that's a very uh, interesting conversation, and that we can see here in HIMSS also yeah. tools and some discuss this, the same problems that we have in Brazil yeah. and take the experience of, of uh, many other countries. And we have also a very brand new uh, legislation about privacy in Brazil, and we have some time to deploy it till next year. Mm -hmm. And we see that um, in Europe, the GDPR that is in place for some, some time, and HIPAA compliance that a long time are, are in place here in the US. And then we take all this experience to bring to Brazil and discuss that. So on a world stage, um, people uh, are kind of at different levels of um, how far they've gotten in being progressive. We had somebody earlier on the show who was from Sweden, and it seemed quite clear when I asked him, where do you fall on the global landscape in terms of progressive? He's like, oh, we're doing great. <laughs> so where do you fall on that kind of scope of, of being more conservative or more uh, progressive as a country? Yes, well, we think that uh, we have some very many common problems, mm -hmm. the interoperability, okay. privacy, and um, of course, uh, Brazil is very particular, we have a huge country, but U.S. also, but we have uh, some uh, health system is uh, quite different, we have a lot of public health, health uh, system and a private health system. Uh, so there are some particularities that are, are quite different. Yes. But uh, uh, it's amazing that uh, we can discuss in terms of the deploying of the tech, the deployment of the technology. We are pretty uh, like all over the world. Of course, if we are talking about, for example, Finland, that's a very small country, yeah. it's much easier to deploy a public. Uh, that's a really good point about size. I actually spoke with someone at this conference from Brazil uh, who was working on a big teledermatology project in Sao Paulo, and uh, uh, Eduardo Codioli. He told me that um, the size of the city in, in Sao Paulo is just a huge... Yeah, just in Sao Paulo we have 2,000 million people, so wow, Sao Paulo it's a, almost a country. Yeah. At the same time, we have some distant place that we need to cover also. Mm -hmm. And we have infrastructure problems for telecommunication, for example, and places that the doctors do not want to go there because it's so far away. And technology, it's a very good tool to, to cover that uh, distant places. Um, well, moreover, we have the same discussion about analytics. Yeah. Uh, I suppose that it's a uh, worldwide discussion and how to deploy, how to use it. Sure. And it's interesting that uh, we are deploying, yesterday we have a very good, in, in the, the, the keynote speakers, talking about the, the public policies about open data. Yeah. And this is something that we are discussing also in Brazil. We have some uh, protocols already in place to exchange information between providers and health plans. Yep. And, but we are aggregating in this protocol now clinical information. Right. So it's a very huge, um, uh, right. challenge. Yes, it is. Um, Luis, good luck. Keep fighting the good fight. And thank you for being on our show. All right. Thank you too much. Right. I appreciate there's a bunch of stuff that uh, we're looking at, and I think first thing to know is um, with a mandate as broad as ours, we are always responsive. So we are always interested in things that uh, are important to folks on our health plan side, they're important to folks working in our hospitals, uh, to our providers, to our members. So, so we have a very broad mandate, but we're always working a few things that we think are really timely and important. Um, right now, there is a big focus around um, just the opioid epidemic, um, and we see that as, as really a spectrum of places where we need innovation and new solutions. Um, from pain management, sort of are there alternatives to opioids that we should be considering and looking at? Um, some really interesting work coming uh, in the VR world there uh, in terms of pain management um, uh, and lots of other innovations. Uh, and then part of that is also how can we better 
monitor and understand what's going on with some of uh, our use of these heavier um, opioid narcotics. And then on the far end uh, is the substance use disorder um, innovations that we're seeing. So folks who are thinking about different service models um, for folks who are struggling with addiction and uh, struggling with substance use disorder. Um, so we see a lot of interesting things that are both innovating um, at the service level. So how do you provide new and different um, services for folks with these disorders. Uh, the biggest innovation, what's interesting there, is the focus on evidence. So how can we find uh, proof of what works? Um, and that links to some of the other things that we've been looking at, which are more about, so not disrupting the actual service that's provided or providing a different type of service, but rather how do we uh, monitor, measure, um, get information about what is succeeding for a particular patient and what is not. Um, so that's a whole area that we think um, there's a huge amount of need um, and a lot of really uh, mission-driven companies that we're excited to get to know and see if uh, some of them could be impactful for, for our members. I think machine learning has a, a long way to go uh, in clinical practice of medicine. Uh, there are places where we use it, uh, such as interpreting uh, or finding data from PATH reports, uh, but uh, in actual decision making, most of the trials that I've seen uh, have generally not been successful. Uh, and in fact, a lot of clinicians are quite wary about turning uh, that type of process over to uh, technology. So that uh, uh, I'm sure that we'll continue to see refinements and I'm sure eventually we'll, we'll get there, uh, particularly in evaluating symptoms and other things like that. But uh, I think that it's uh, still something for the future. Everyone. I'm Stephen Wellman with Hims TV. Today I'm speaking with E. Jane Caraway with Georgia USA. Uh, e. Jane, tell us a little bit about what you do at Georgia USA. Well, I am a director with our Global Commerce Division, and our job is to recruit business and industry to the state of Georgia. But we do that by working with partners across the state to come to things like this, to go to a number of different shows, to help promote what's going on in the state of Georgia. That's great. Why is Georgia rapidly becoming a hub for healthcare IT? You know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, actually, him started at Georgia Tech when the organization started many years ago. But we are a leader. We are number three in software development. We are a leader in cybersecurity. We're a le leader in health IT. Greenway started the, in the area. Uh, AirWatch, uh, now VMware, all started in the state. We've got a huge number. But if you look at the southeast and you look at what's going on in that area, you think about health care, you think about CDC, you think about American Cancer Society is based there. That's the reason. What resources are available to companies looking to relocate to the state of Georgia? That's a great question. You'll notice on some of our logo that we have been, been cited as the number one place to do business. Sorry. Number one state to do business for the last six years in a row. And that is by folks who are looking at the holistic picture. It's our, it's our job creation, it is our low taxes, it's our environment, it's our uh, ecosystem that we have across the board, whether it be FinTech, whether it be IT, whether it be cybersecurity, all of it. Georgia's a great place, plus we're strategically located. Logistically, you know, we are the world's most traveled airport. Uh, you can get anywhere within a couple of hours, you know, on a national basis. You can get around the world, millions of flights, people coming in every year. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we are so successful in a number of things. One thing I'll add, sorry. Um, at the end of 2018, in the computer science data analytics arena, just sitting in the, the state of Georgia, we had over 160,000 folks able to work, able to work in this, this healthcare arena. Pretty exciting. It's interesting, you just talked about talent. That's one of the major challenges facing most uh, companies today, right? Workforce development, talent acquisition, and talent identification. What resources does the state of Georgia make available to companies who relocate there when it comes to workforce development? Let's talk about that. Georgia has what we call Georgia Quick Start, and it is the oldest program that will help a company be trained, get up, get started, and ready to go to work. So we offer Georgia Quick Start to companies that are coming or companies that are growing. That's done in cooperation with the state of Georgia and our technical college systems and our colleges and universities. 
The other thing is the Hope Scholarship that's been out around a number of years, and that allows students from Georgia or, or some companies that are coming in to be able to go under that scholarship not paying uh, out-of-state tuition, waivers, and those kind of things. So that's another piece. The other piece that I think is very exciting is about eight years ago, we went out to business and industry and said, okay, let's talk about what those high career demand initiatives, what do you have? What do you need? Looking at what you have right now, knowing that the people may be coming to your workforce or maybe in sixth grade, what do we need to do to get all that ready? What do we need to have that prepared? We now have 19 programs that you can go start out in a technical college system and in, in, in computer science, in a number of different things um, that you can go to a technical college free of charge. And then you can tap the hope on to that when you start to a, a higher education level. So it's pretty exciting, that's one thing. Let's talk about some more of the things that we have done. We have internships in health IT. You'll see students running around here. We have a number of students that are part of that health IT network that in colleges and universities that we bring to HIMSS with us every year, but those companies also have internships across the state. So from Augusta to Atlanta to North Georgia, we have them all over where we do that with the workforce. And the final thing I will tell you about our workforce and what's happening with, especially in the IT arena, is we started out um, a few years ago, we now have computer science and data analytics as a second language in junior high and high school. So it makes a huge difference. Coding is included. Very impressive. Clearly education plays a major role in workforce development and attracting new companies to uh, Georgia for healthcare IT. What are some other factors that make Georgia stand out as a hub for HIT firms looking to relocate? Innovation. It exists there. I mean, we are, we are you know, you look at, we're number three for creating apps. Uh, we are number one in the area of IT development and in, in research. If you look at what exists, if you think, I mentioned the CDC, American Cancer Society, but Georgia Tech is a huge research, UGA, Emory, of course, plays a huge role in that research. They all partner with us. We have, in one building, we have 34 incubators that are around IT-related pieces. If you look at, uh, a couple of years ago, Anthem announced some growth in Atlanta, but you also have another a number of other companies in the health arena and insurance that have announced that they're going to look at health IT, how it happens. Look in this booth. I mean, I have everybody from someone who has um, um, diabetes app to the American Cancer Society to Georgia Tech to uh, FinTech and, and, and people who handle payee information. We're the place that's growing. Not only in that one building do we have 34 incubators, but across the state, there are a number of more. People are reaching out and helping people grow in this arena, and that makes all the difference. It's very impressive. One final question for you. Um, you know, what other factors stand out? What are some success stories, right? You mentioned Anthem, a few of the universities there. Give us some success stories of health IT firms that have either started up in Georgia or relocated and met with great success. Well, I could talk about uh, Greenway, and Greenway was founded and started in uh, by the Green family uh, in, in Georgia. Uh, they had one of the first conferences on health IT in Atlanta many years ago, had about 5,000 people there. You know, that was huge for them. Um, they continue to be a success, but all scripts has expanded there. McKesson now change has a huge presence in the state of Georgia and have expanded there. Um, Airwatch VMware, you know, started in, in Georgia, founded there uh, by a serial entrepreneur that continues to invest in, and put money in Georgia. Uh, so we have, I mean, there are a number, if you go on and on, most recently, BioIQ, uh, put their U.S. headquarters there, and the reason he said is because of the valuable workforce, but but also the um, collaboration and how companies all work together and communities and and all work together. Thank you so much, E. Jane, for giving us a little insight. This is Stephen Wellman with Hims TV. Thank you for watching.
with Lisa Plagemeyer, who is the Chief Evangelist of Incosec Institute. Um, from what I understand, your institute actually works with being an education provider specifically for security. That's so right. So here at HIMSS, I got to believe you're taking a look at what's going on. What do you feel the status of security is? Well, I think there's a lot of people doing a lot of great things. Um, I personally know a guy at uh, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in in, in the globe, on the in the world, in the world, um, who started as a pharmaceutical sales rep, and he's actually running their security training and awareness program. He's doing a great job because he knows how to connect with people. He has that sales background. Huh. Um, same thing in another major insurer. Um, a woman who's running a program that is all about engaging people and getting followers and getting pull for that security information. I think too often so much of what we do is very compliance focused. Um, and we push it on employees and it's, 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 uh, we drive those to those audit reports. And uh, to be honest, you know, the bad guys really don't care if you're compliant or not, right? They're, they're attacking us one way or the other. True. Um, but it's scary to run a, a program where you're relying on employees to pull for information. That means you have to be genuinely engaging and helpful in the information that you're putting out there for your employees. Mm. Um, in the realm of kind of, uh, the, you know, when you think about technology and security, what I see in my mind is machinery, uh, metal, um, fortresses, or whatever else. Peripheral it, security. Yes, and I'm interested, technology. you know, what I'm hearing from you is yeah. the kind of human element of security. So talk to me about that. Well, there's kind of three legs of the stool that people often talk about when they talk about security. There's people, process, and technology, and everybody thinks about that technology, right? You think about firewalls and all these things that protect us from ourselves. Um, and like, it's made, we're cool. Right, right, and so therefore we can actually engage in risky behavior and try to go to websites that might actually have malware or where something bad could happen um, because we're relying on that technology that's out there. But the reality is that that technology has to be purchased and installed and configured by a human. Mm -hmm. And I've seen uh, security technologies and tools that have been purchased and never installed, installed but never configured, and those are all human error type incidents. Mm. Um, so, and the same thing with process. Processes have to be designed and executed by human beings, mm -hmm. and so those are fallible by nature as well. So really all three legs of that stool are, are people. It comes down to human beings. Which is such a parallel to the way that where everyone's talking about healthcare now, right? Patient first, don't forget the actual personal interaction of a patient. And how right. interesting it is to hear you talk about the, the human side of security, mm -hmm. which sort of feels like it's forgotten. Do you have thoughts on that, Steve? Yeah, well, I think one of the challenges of security is that the process, right, one of mm -hmm. the three uh, things we were just talking about, is often created by people that don't think of the human component, right? They think of a process right. that is designed purely to secure, right, mm -hmm. access mm -hmm. and modalities, but it's not really driven in a way that an average employee would want to do it. Right. right? So the process may be perfect, but if no one can comply with it, right. then it's ultimately useless. And if it drives everyone to break security protocols, then you might as well not even have the process, right? right? right. So I think there's not enough time given to make what might one call people-friendly process, right, or human-friendly process. Yeah, we actually see that a lot with the technology companies as well because they try really hard to develop technology that's frictionless for the user mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes that little bit of security that's put in the way, right, If to stop us from using a password that's been previously compromised, for example, right. or um, people, society today unfortunately values convenience more than security. There was a, a news story yeah. that came out lately, there's a technology manufacturer that's being sued for implementing multi-factor authentication. Yeah, it's almost like the, you really know, there's make... something about the best next shiny thing, mm -hmm. I think we're kind of in the middle of it, and it's good to have people to remind us that it's not always awesome. So thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks Lisa. for having me. Thank you. So precision medicine so far has focused on more genomic data and understanding genomic data more for individualized therapy. But actually other aspects of precision medicine is understanding patients' environment and the lifestyle. So the that part is very critical because as we know from the social determinants of health, um, various um, living conditions, patients' daily routines, and their uh, socioeconomic conditions play an important role uh, in patient outcomes. So these are more like uh, underwater part of the iceberg. So the, what we need to do is these soft issues like the social determinants of health, like the 
and patients and living environment, living context, and uh, their daily routines should be somehow integrated to uh, EHR data, and it should be available for the use of the provider when they um, plan their therapy, when they develop the uh, therapy plans for the patients. So the, it is, I think, essential to integrate these social determinants with the clinical data and then and uh, we need to come up with more sophisticated clinical decision support systems that's going to utilize both clinical data and social determinants of health for the best patient outcomes. With me now is my co-host Dave Moyo, who is the associate editor of Moby Health News, and Carl Potterack, who is an MD and a medical director of Applied Clinical Informatics at Mayo Clinic Hospital. So, Carl, I know that the Mayo Clinic is sophisticated in terms of its medical records. It ranks high in the MRAM scale. Um, what have been some of the things you've seen that have come as a result of this implementation? Well, we've been able to, I think, we've been able to integrate our uh, records across our entire system and so that uh, patients who are in one part of our system now, we're all on the same medical record and it makes it very easy for us to get information no matter what part of our system patients have been seen in. Now, Carl, you've done all this hard work. you put in the time, the investment. How's it turned around? Are you seeing any benefits in your institution? Uh, we are actually, one in our case, one of the things that we're seeing is we had a lot of legacy systems previously, a lot of individual departmental systems, unit systems, things like that, that we've been able to get rid of uh, kind of supporting those systems and just all work on one system. We've actually generated some ROI from getting rid of uh, old systems that we no longer need to support. And in terms of inoperability and silos, right, we've heard a lot about different silos and not being able to communicate with each other. So are you also dealing with that, even though you are sophisticated with your EHRs? You know, I think we've had a lot of that in the past. That's been an issue, not just from a medical record standpoint, but just from for a lot of reasons. And I think this kind of all being on the same system has really helped to start break that down. It's process. You're beginning to feel it. We definitely are. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, and you are here to give a talk, so talk a little bit about that. So I'm going to talk about uh, data from wearable devices, uh, the kind of the consumer grade things that people wear to count steps, heart rate, that sort of thing. The data is out there, it's being collected by the manufacturers of those devices, but up to this point, uh, healthcare systems haven't really used that data very much for a lot of different reasons. There's some barriers to that, there's some challenges, but there's certainly a promise there of if the healthcare systems can get some of this data and link that up with outcomes, we may be able to do some, some uh, uh, prediction based on people's steps, heart rate, that sort of thing. Dave, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, you, um, you know, seeing all these startups that are talking about, um, oh my gosh, I'm, you know, we have something that's generating data, we're able to put it on a wearable. Mm -hmm. What's your experience of patients and consumers actually living through to wanting that data and working with it? Well, it's really interesting that we're talking about consumer wearables as opposed to medical grade wearables that their hospitals are using them all the time. We're seeing all these deals with Fitbit and other major consumer wearable players that are putting these devices into the hands of patients on plans, mm -hmm. patients in systems, and generally, you know, there's data out there saying that the patients will stick with their devices if they like the device, if it looks nice, and from your perspective, if it's functional enough to get accurate readings that are usable and you can integrate them into your data system, there's no reason not to. It generally makes everyone happy if you can make it happen. You feel the same way that patients are adhering? And wanting it? Yeah, I, I think patients are definitely wanting, and one of the big barriers we have now is physicians and health systems don't always know what to do with this data. Right. And that's one of the things we're going to have. Well, to this is something that we certainly learned. <laughs> Carl, thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So I do feel, you know, I had read that in the world of a Fitbit, when they first came out, it was such an exciting time and people so wanted to have this data. I had read that the average length of time someone uses one is three months. Absolutely. Stickiness is a constant issue, whether it's Fitbit or other company, consumer brand companies, um, clothing makers or shoemakers like Nike loves to talk about this. How do we get our devices with the people? How do we make them stay? Do we build it within a larger ecosystem? Yeah. Is it just a design issue? It's 
a constant struggle just from healthcare's perspective, but also just the people manufacturing these devices. Yeah, and a continual conversation to be had. <laughs> With us now is Stacy Cummings, who is a program executive of MHS Genesis. Um, Stacy, it's great to see you. Great to see you again, thank you. So now that the DOD, the Department of Defense, and the VA are deploying the same electronic health record, they finally got that together, um, what steps are you taking to leverage best practices? So the DOD is fully supportive of the decision that the VA made to deploy the same electronic health record. Clearly the Department of Defense has 9.5 million beneficiaries that are service members, veterans, and their families. And as service members are transitioning from the Department of Defense to the P Department of Veterans Affairs, we want that to be as smooth and seamless as possible. And so working with our vendor team, we are uh, under contract with the Lidos Partnership for Defense Health. Mm -hmm. We have worked with them to look at commercial best practices. We've also worked with other great organizations like HIMSS and CLASS to learn about what has been successful in the commercial space and then what is unique about the Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs as we're implementing a single integrated electronic health record. Uh -huh. Some of those best practices are around how we deploy our infrastructure, having the right bandwidth, making sure our circuits are in place, cybersecurity, leveraging the best of DOD cybersecurity as well as commercial cybersecurity best practices, and then training, having peer experts, making sure that we have um, highly trained people in the military treatment facilities, in the clinics, who can help the people that they're working with to adopt this new, modern, secure, connected electronic health record. Now, I'm happy that you brought up cybersecurity. I'm gonna bring you back a little bit. Obviously, sure. you're working with people's personal health data, mm -hmm. and you're the government. Correct. Of course, cybersecurity has to be an issue. Can you talk a little bit more about what you're doing in that area? Sure. So, um, patient safety and securing our patients' uh, critical data yeah. are our two highest priorities in the deployment of MHS Genesis. And we in the DoD hold ourselves to a very high standard for cybersecurity. And so we're approaching cybersecurity uh, with a layered approach. So we're deploying a, a new network that is built with cybersecurity in mind. We're securing using the risk management framework uh, and understanding what any vulnerabilities are associated with our medical devices. Right. All the way back through the local area network, through the wide area network, to our data center in Kansas City. And our data center in Kansas City, we've done um, scans of the, of the environment to make sure that we've patched any vulnerabilities. And I think one of the unique things that we're doing in the Department of Defense is regular adversarial assessments. So we bring in friendly hackers and we actually ask them to attack our system so that they can find things in advance of our adversaries and give us the opportunity to find new ways to secure, but also to monitor and defend our network. I gotta say, that's probably some kid's dream that they get to come in and hack the army, you know what I mean? So what have you found actually makes your population different? You talked about you know, you know, being distinct. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that makes us different is we operate, we operate in an operational medicine environment. Yeah. So in theater, in a place where it's very austere, you don't have a lot of bandwidth, you don't have a lot of um, physical infrastructure. Yeah. We also operate aboard ships, which is very unique. In fact, we have two hospital ships, the size of which rival a, a commercial hospital. They have wow. surgical bays, they have ICU, a full up hospital that floats. Wow. So those are definitely some uniquenesses to the department. Department of Defense. Um, the other uniqueness is that our beneficiary, our patients, as well as our providers and users, move on a regular basis. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the benefit of having all of our patients' data and having standard workflows, whether you're on the East Coast, West Coast, or overseas, right. from it, a patient perspective and from a user perspective, right. we standardize those workflows, right. and I, as a patient, have a consistent experience regardless of yeah. which you can get you can get it anywhere whenever you're exactly. you know, on your journey. Stacy, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Thank you. It was great to, Good to see you again. Wow. Um, so we actually had a chance to speak with Stacy Cummings and also uh, Major General Lee Payne, who is an operating physician, and he spoke about what it was like for him when he uh, was operating on the front lines, and now he has the ability with the technology to get a patient's record kind of pop up on a screen as somebody's coming in the emergency room. And what a what a huge difference! It's a whole different meaning to point of care, huh? I know. Yeah, for real. For real. Next uh, on this show, we have. Ben
Fred Moscovich, who is the project director of health information technology from the Pew Charitable Trust. Um, ben, it's really nice to see you. Thank um, you for having me. Oh, good. I'm glad. And I hope you've had a coffee, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, with the adoptions of EHRs, what safety issues um, do you feel have arisen that you may not have anticipated in the beginning of the process? Our research has shown that the usability of electronic health records can contribute to patient safety problems. When we talk about usability, it's both the layout and design of the system, but it's also how it's customized, how it's implemented within a healthcare facility, and how it's used by clinicians. One research study that we did with uh, MedStar Health and other children's hospitals huh? found that about of 9,000 medication safety events uh, that were identified, about a third of them were as a result or the usability of the EHR contributed to those safety problems. Wow. So obviously we're here at HIMSS, everyone's talking about interoperability and data silos, protecting the data that's inside of those silos, but having one silo speak to another silo is a whole different ball game. What type of work can or protocols can we look into for protecting the communication between these silos? <laughs> We're working on two of the key challenges to interoperability and in the exchange of data between those two silos. One is patient matching, which is how do you know that the patient in one record is the same as the patient in another record? Because wow. patients' information changes, they move, um, patients have similar information, and so it can be difficult to match those records. Our research has found that uh, two key, there are two key ways to make progress. One is that if the data that are used to match those records are standardized, that can improve match rates. So for example, address can be formatted in different ways. If you standardize the way address is documented, mm -hmm. then that can uh, help link records. And the government can help make progress in that type of standardization. We've also been talking to a gajillion people here, and a lot of them have spoken about AI, which I think started as a buzzword, but is now swiftly becoming real. What are the protocols you're putting in place to actually deal with the safety ha hazards of that? Because certainly AI in itself is moving faster and faster. It gets smarter and smarter. So what have you seen in your research there? We haven't looked specifically at AI, but we have looked at some emerging technologies like biometrics. Huh. We conducted focus groups with patients on patient matching, and what we heard uh, by a large portion of those patients was that they want to be using biometrics to help link their records, and that's because they use biometrics every day to unlock their smartphones or board a plane um, and are increasingly using it in the da those daily lives. So why can't this uh, advanced technology also be used to help foster interoperability? Ability. The problem is there's a bunch of key questions that need to be answered first, including around privacy and security. So what we plan to do is convene companies in this space and other experts and help uh, establish a framework for the use of biometrics and other innovative technologies to help link records. So um, Ben and I were talking about the vibe here, and uh, it really feels optimistic. And I'm curious for you, you know, if you're a researcher, you're really looking on what's real and what's not. You're learning from your mistakes. Um, what are your feelings about being here um, in terms of progress? Well, at the start of the week, yeah. there was a big moment in health IT, and that was the release of two regulations, one from the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, yep. the other from uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, that really set the groundwork for progress on health IT. Yep. And one of the common threads in both those regulations was the use of FIRE, which is a way yes, to exchange we, data. we spoke to Graham, right. <laughs> and now it's really beginning to come together. Um, ben, I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you. Thanks Thank for having you. me. Thank you. Okay, thoughts? Oh, man, I, can I say I agree? Is that a thought? Yes, that count? it counts. It counts. <laughs> um, these are all definitely huge issues, and the rule changes and the announcements at the beginning of the week that he was describing are a large deal, and they're going to influence what the field is doing for the next couple of years and whether or not everyone can come together. Right, and the fact that actually there's change within the rules means, mm -hmm. like, you know what, this is really real, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. With us now is Sabra Aaron Javia. You have to tell me if I got that right. Did I? Close. Oh, close. Okay. Um, who's a section of the hospital medicine and associate professor of medicine at Penn. Um, let's talk about, for you, what are you excited about here at HIMSS? Um, I'm really inspired by seeing everyone who's here and working so hard to improve the care that we're able to provide for patients. Yep. It's really exciting just to see everyone working towards this common goal and learning from each other and finding ways to collaborate with each other, which I think is really great. Um, I think we're on a 
wave or a, like starting a new wave of change in uh, in healthcare. And you know, we've learned a lot from the last 10 years. I think we've done the best that we could with what we knew. And now I think we've learned so much to actually really change and take it in new directions that we haven't yet. So I'm really excited about that. I have to say, happy you're here. I'm from the Philly area myself, nice. so it's nice to have some Pennsylvania representation. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, could you give me maybe a concrete example of what you're describing? You're describing the changes in the past 10 years, and you're seeing a lot of enthusiasm, excitement, and maybe some action here, and especially on the tech aspect and how it relates to care. Do you have anything you saw on the show floor in any of the sessions that has really blown your mind? Yeah, I think one of the really exciting things that I'm learning about is integrating learning about the social determinants of health in the technology that we use to interface with our patients. Yes. Um, a lot of what I've seen is uh, using that to really you know, prescribe things to patients or help with our interactions with them. But I think another really creative way is bringing it into the clinician workflow so that while I'm still taking care of you in the hospital, for example, I can factor that into my care plan with you or I can factor it into the discussions I have or my discharge planning. Um, I think integrating that with apps and other technology that we use in our daily life, which feels so natural but hasn't yet for medicine, is where I'm really excited to see technology um, become not almost a, you know, a barrier or a thing we have to use, but something we're excited to use because it actually makes things easier. I feel um, super excited to hear you say that. You know, I feel uh, the world has been, I, so I live with MS, I'm a patient, and I'm so aware of how sometimes when you're trying to talk about your journey, your health journey, that if it's not clinically proven, it hasn't been discussed. You know, one small example is diet, right? That, yeah. you know, you say, I know I feel better when I don't eat dairy, and I have a, a neurologist say to you, well, I don't really want to hear about it because it's not clinically Absolutely. proven, it's frustrating. I so can imagine. For you, too, you have such a great compassionate doctor <laughs> moment right there. Thank you, doctor. Um, but for you to recognize, you know, arguably social deter determinants are unstructured data and the fact that you are thinking those through, um, putting them in the chart and recognizing that that may affect the overall lifestyle is huge. Yeah. Do you feel like that's a common trend within your practice? I think it's a growing realization and part of what we need to do is educate clinicians. I mean, the fact is we learn medicine based on evidence and based on books and of course interacting with patients but learning that our patients are people like us and have this whole other environment that affects their health yeah. is something that I don't think we have, at least not when I was in medical school, which yeah. you know, was a little while ago, um, <laughs> is not something that we talked about very much, yeah. but I think they're starting to bring that in more, integrating patients into the education process as well. But I love that you used the word journey because it's really important. It's not just about that one moment. I might see you for you know a couple days in the hospital, but you have your whole life outside, and you know we might craft this great plan with everything controlled in the hospital, right? Um, and it can you know be completely different with how it's implemented outside. So that's one of the things that I think we need to do a better job Excuse teaching me. clinicians yeah. and medical students and trainees is how do we see our patients as a whole person and factor that in. Um, before you go, yes. please pronounce your name correctly for okay. the world. It's <laughs> Saba Aaron Javia. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Dr. Thank Aaron you very much. Thank you. Um, so that's really uh, meaningful to me in terms of the whole idea of looking holistically at a patient. And I'm sure at Moby Health seeing startups who are probably trying to uh, recognize that stuff and, yeah. and make it part of the deal. <laughs> no, absolutely. Just so many focused on, especially with personal technologies that are such a part of digital medicine yeah. or personal medicine, yeah. uh, being able to log what your experience is, communicate that to the provider, yeah. and enabling that through yeah, technology. Yeah, and, and what happens. It's really great. Um, up next, we have Adam Green, who is a JD, MPH, and a partner at Davis Wright Tremaine, LLP. Um, it is really nice to meet you. You are a master in the world of security and compliance. <laughs> is that a fair statement? Um, I would say compliance more so. Okay. And I don't know about master. Okay. That's very nice of you to say, but it, it, it's what I do for a living, yeah. and I, I hope I know more than the next guy when possible. <laughs> well, that's good. So I know that um, in the 90s, you had the High Tech Act, which really started to incentivize uh, EHRs to be part of hospitals. Yeah. Um, how do you feel like that's going in terms of integration and compliance? So, you know, I, I think. The High Tech Act has certainly served its purpose in many respects in that there's been a sea change in getting people from paper to electronic. Um, now, obviously, I think we all know there's still a lot of goals that need to be achieved with respect to interoperability. You know, on the compliance front, I think it complicated and challenged things in many respects. I mean, paper records um, were not 
naturally secure. I mean, they were getting breached all the time, but um, electronic records have really changed it to, you know, the order of magnitude to what can go wrong when yep. something, you know, when a USB drive gets lost or stolen. And I think High Tech Act has caused a lot of confusion with respect to, oh, we have an electronic medical record, do we just need to do a risk assessment of our EMR, um, and then we're fine, do we need to worry about the rest? And you know, there was a lot of focuses strictly on meaningful use and getting that in place right. and not necessarily realizing that, well, that's great if you've you know, addressed the risks of your EMR, yes. but if the social security numbers in your billing software are going out the door, that's a still problem. a huge problem. Yeah. <laughs> And that's just the hospitals that have moved ahead and moved, pushed themselves into the EHRs, EMRs. Yeah. There's still, we saw in an earlier session it was spoken here, of roughly one in 10 of these hospitals are still not fully electronic. How does that confusion that you're describing that's happening to the majority of hospitals, we're not even considering the 10% that haven't made it there yet, what's going on with them? Well, yeah. The HIPAA security rule has been around since, you know, 2005 was the original compliance date, and so from that date on, people have known that they have to comply with the security rule. Mm -hmm. And from that date on, we've had large, sophisticated institutions that have invested huge amounts of resources into compliance, and then we've had pretty large um, portion of the population that the security rule kind of came and went and still are not you know, significantly beyond where they were back in 2000 with respect to security policies and procedures. What's um, going to happen to them? Well, you know, there's always, it's always a roll of the dice. I mean, you know, they, understandably, their focus is oftentimes, you know, patients, patient care, and we don't have the time or resources to staff up and invest significantly in security. Yeah. And, you know, Patients oftentimes don't get to see that there's a lack of security. It's not like when I go into the doctor's office, I've got a Wi-Fi sniffer and I'm looking for <laughs> vulnerabilities. So it really comes down to, do they get a breach and yeah. detect that breach? And at that point, they suddenly discover how much exposure they have by having not put in place a robust security rule And program. also that <laughs> patients will have a moment where they say, you know what, if you can't access my records, like, see you later. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, it's really yeah. nice to see you, Adam. Thank you for being on our show. Oh, my pleasure. Thank Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, one of the things that I would have loved to have asked Adam, because he's a HIPAA expert, is whether or not um, HIPAA needs to be modernized um, because it was started earlier or not, you know? Absolutely. We're moving fully fledged, full speed into the digital age, and that changes everything from how we protect the patient's data, to how we do care, and how we merge the two. Right. Absolutely true. And, uh, <laughs> you know, actually, I spoke to somebody who said that HIPAA, everyone's so scared of HIPAA, but it's not as bad as, as you think, and you can kind of work around it or, again, another conversation. Sure. So we're here now with Patrick Sundstrom. Patrick, tell me a little bit about why you're here and what your background is. I mean, if you're devoted to contribute to healthcare transformation, HIMSS 19 is really the place to be. It's yeah. like, you know, this kind of melting pot where private, public uh, technology and policy meet to exchange knowledge and create relationships. And uh, we truly believe that to further catalyze the transformation of healthcare, we need to get public-private technology and policy to, to be aligned. Uh, and I'm convinced that the future of healthcare is going to be built on the strongest of partnerships. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're here from Sweden. And we're here with a big delegation with top leaders from our healthcare providers, wow. our industry, and our policymakers. So knowledge exchange, get the same experience to take it home and to speed up innovation. So, Where fantastic. is, I know very little yeah. about Sweden's innovation, yeah. um, where, are, where do you fall in terms of other countries, in terms of being progressive? I would say we are at the top, and we have, okay. <laughs> we have an ambitious oh, goal. Yeah, sure. We have an ambitious goal to be the, the top leader in the world by yeah. 2025 in using technology to transform healthcare. And so we started that journey a lot of years ago. I yeah. mean, Sweden was one of those countries that digitized the first. The kind of uh, movement we are in now is trying to move healthcare from bricks and walls of hospitals to the spot where the patient is. And obviously, technology and teams are the enablers. Right. 
like meet the mm -hmm. patient where they are. Exactly. Uh, now, do you feel like when you have an older, so we know here in America, yeah. uh, the whole world of the silver tsunami yeah. of older people yeah. coming through and the argument that an older person won't adapt technology. Mm -hmm. Has that been the same for you? We don't see that in Sweden, actually. Okay. It's, it's something that we younger people think and maybe, you know, the kind of healthcare providers and the professionals, but when we really make sure that these older people get the, the proper tools, uh, they can handle it and they are, I mean, they are obsessed about it. And we've seen fantastic examples in the elderly care in Sweden. Uh, and I will also say that our main priority in Sweden is about managing chronic diseases and promote health. We truly believe that we have to discharge patients with digital solutions, with sensors, with train, training programs, wow. with, with uh, other stuff that makes continuous uh, monitoring possible, uh, and also to to give out uh, decision support uh, systems and digital nudges that will prevent the chronic uh, patient to get worse. So I think our, our goal is to support pe people to stay in a circle of well-being rather than get worse and need to go to hospitals or primary care centers. Wow. It all sounds so, very ambitious. Yeah. So <laughs> if I went online and I looked at the metrics of the success rates and the positive outcomes yeah. of Sweden compared to other countries, yeah. would it be like this? No, it's not like that. I mean, uh, we have our challenges as well, but we have some fundamental things in place and yeah. we have it on a national level and not many countries have that on a national level. We have a national service platform with services for every patient. Yeah. So as a citizen, you can uh, get access to your fully medical record online Right. in a national service, yes. at the moment you want it. Right. We have a national uh, patient overview, so all every healthcare provider could, could get access to data with the history of the patient, regardless of, you know, which kind of vendor you're using for EMRs and stuff like that. Right. You can book on, uh, appointments online, you can renew prescriptions, e-referrals. So like let that. me ask you this, um, that's all awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, give me your leading issue that you're dealing with. My leading issue, because I'm working on policy level, yeah. so it's trying all the regulations and rules we have in Sweden are really designed on yesterday's logic. Uh -huh. We need to get the policies aligned to drive further innovation in healthcare yeah. and to make this great innovation we see at HIMSS 19 coming together in a sustainable way in Sweden. But so. governments must see all the positives that are coming, which makes me think you're in for an easier fight um, to yeah. change those policies. Yeah, yeah, I most. mean, it, it's, it's our main topic. And in Sweden, yeah. we have a decentralized system, so the regions are fully responsible for healthcare and their levy taxes. And the state has quite limited responsibility. It's about regulations and laws. So right. that's the main, main topic for our government. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being on our show. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I wish I could take more notes. <laughs> yeah. You know, send them out. Yeah. So enjoy the conference. Yeah, thank you. Nice being here. Cool. Wow. <laughs> fundamental, fundamental changes from the get-go that I think seems very confident and clear that, uh, that things are working, you know? Absolutely. And I don't know about you, I wasn't too well versed in Sweden's health initiatives. It's nice to get a refresher of what's going on across I the agree. ocean. I agree. Well, this is what I think is so great about HIMSS, too, is Absolutely. that they're so global and they so deeply care about connecting everybody. And case in point, I mean, you could argue that guy has a lot, and with his delegation, has a lot that they've already figured out. The fact that they want to come here and learn is really, really cool. So, Absolutely. Um, here we are next with Gene Patagan, and I hope I got that right, um, who is the CEO and founder of Aduso Limited. Um, and Gene, tell me a little bit about you and what you are working on. Uh, I'm working on user experience on electronic health record systems. Okay. Hmm. So we've talked a lot about um, the headache of actually integrating an EHR. Um, yeah. And one of the things that somebody spoke about is that when the High Tech Act came into fruition, people wanted to be so quick about getting it in that there was a lot of UI UX issues. Exactly. A la too many clicks. Yeah. Right? So tell me how you're fixing that. We have been doing our research in a couple of hospital districts in Finland, actually. So we are working in Nordic countries, but now we are looking at the U.S. as well because the challenges are pretty similar still in both sides of the pond, let's say. so. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you feel like with what you see, you're doing the individual usability, do you feel like it also is possible
possible for bigger systems to collaborate and work well together? Yes, it is. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's especially important to consider already like uh, cross-border interoperability between the systems. Yeah. So that would help it a lot. And that would make it possible to also do some benchmarking. And I think that's important and that can be done also in the US and also in the Nordic healthcare system. Uh -huh. um, yeah, we, again, we have really found that there's been enormous progress in interoperability getting better. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting is technology coming in and, and what's happening to the physicians, right? Mm. Because you're trying to help them on their most simple form of an EHR, yeah. um, but now they have all these other things that supposedly are trying to help them further. Right, and how do you, how are you watching them mitigate that issue? Uh, actually, I see that development in a way that now is the era of good EHR systems, which are uh, widely integrated and interoperable are wired together. That way? Yes. And if then uh, the next uh, next step would be uh, would be uh, like bringing in those new apps and solutions yeah. so the good base uh, with the, those next generation EHRs will make it possible to have those new gadgets and apps coming in right. and working with those systems. But to do that, those uh, you know EHRs, whether or not it seems like people in different systems are changing their own EHR system and individualizing it versus making massive system changes. Is that your experience? Uh, so they are doing that well, to, kind of like per, almost personalizing their own record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's also important thing yeah. that you can like really have uh, individual whatever works for you yeah. as a clinician or a patient or like customer. So if you can take your own patient data with you and make it usable in that way. Yeah, I feel that's very important. But that seems like a pro, but also a con, right? Because if everybody is like personalizing their own system, how do you standardize it to make it better? That's true. Yeah, actually. Figure that out right yeah. now. <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> uh, it just seems like maybe him, you know, 22, that will be like, wow, that was such a great idea to allow people to make it easier to use at an individual level. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, anyway, so all good things to think about. It's really nice to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. And your shirt, by the way, is amazing. And just Thanks want to throw for that having out there. me here. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have definitely felt like uh, this, I had read and heard that one of the biggest problems with EHR is the haste that you just didn't think about the UI UX, like we weren't sophisticated enough. Absolutely. And I, don't, I think it's worth stopping on the point you're talking about, personalizing it to the individual institution. Healthcare, by its very nature, isn't one size fits all. And we're working on these problems of standardization and how to get one system to work in the next system. But we still need to find a way to do that yeah. that allows for some wiggle room because that's the reality right. of healthcare is what we have to work through. Totally. With us now is Brian Mack, who is a manager of marketing and communications at the Great Lakes Health Co Connect. Um, it's really nice to have you on the show, Brian. Thanks for having me. So, I did. Um, health exchange, Brian Mack. Yes. Let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Great Lakes Health Connect Health uh, is the we are the leading uh, a provider of health information exchange services and, and solutions in the state of Michigan. Okay, hold on. Yep. Um, define Sorry. health information exchange. Okay. <laughs> so, health information exchange. Uh, how can I do that as quickly? as possible. You know that the the, uh, the Affordable Care Act required that everybody be on electronic health records mm -hmm. in terms of the, the providers across the continuum of care. Yep. The ACA did not uh, specifically, well, actually the ACA uh, uh, also said that those health systems needed to be able to communicate with each other, but there was not infrastructure that existed to do that. Right. That's what Health Information Exchange did right. about 10 years ago. Okay, so it's taking the silos of information that did get 
implemented, finding a way for it to all come together. That is correct. Okay. Right. Right. Um, in 10 years, that's a lot of time to put together a solution. It seems like there's still a lot of progress being made and at the same time challenges to overcome. How has it changed over just the time period when this was mandated? Yeah, I think that that's, that's a really accurate assessment, Dave, that it has been, uh, there have been some pretty significant advancements at the local level. There are also some pretty significant challenges. I think one of those challenges that the, is that the governmental dynamics from state to state differ a lot. When we talk about national interoperability, we really need to be focused on common standards across states because you'll have states that are opt-in states. In other words, uh, 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 a patient has to give specific permission to allow their information to be shared. Yeah. Or opt-out states like Michigan, for example, which makes my job a heck of a lot easier because patients are in unless they tell us they want to opt sure. out. So um, so that's been a, one of those challenges. What is the country breakdown? Do you know offhand of how many states are you know, opt-in, how many are off, I, opt I, out? I, I don't off the top of my head. I have looked at that information before. It yeah. varies from state to state. And, and, and some, I think, have not even addressed those issues. We know that some states, in terms of their regional and statewide health information yeah. exchange, infrastructure is very well developed. States like Michigan, uh, states like Colorado, for example. Um, and then there are others that have been lag, that have lagged behind. And again, it's, it's largely because there's not a commonality of standard, right? Um, and so that it makes it challenging. I think that's some of the bad rap that regional health information exchange gets. Right. Um, I was encouraged by Seema Verma's comments yesterday in the opening keynote uh, because we're all a little bit anxious about TEFCA and what that's going to mean when the final rule is ultimately released. But the, uh, the assurances that she gave in the keynote led me to believe that they really are trying to take the dynamics that we are dealing with on the ground into consideration. And I really hope that we see that when the final, when the final rule is produced. We've heard a lot of excitement about the CMS uh, rules that were announced yesterday, which to me seems like a larger entity trying to be like, look, patients are important. Patient data should yeah. be shared. Yeah. Does yeah. that help you on a state level in some way? I, I I hope so. I really do. I think that a lot of the I, I get really frustrated about the concept of interoperability, right? About that mm -hmm. that buzzword in particular. Yep. Um, and it's because I, I don't think that there's a standard definition for the word interoperability. From my perspective at the local level, we are working with the providers at the point of care. Right. And there are things that we can do in that position that you're not going to accomplish through a national initiative. Right, something this big. Right. right. And that's what a benefit to have it on the local level. Exactly. Um, Brian, we really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks welcome. for having me. My pleasure. Welcome. Good show. Thank you. Um, it is. We actually had some politicians on the show from New Jersey who were at the assembly woman level um, and how it was possible to make change. Um, and so I think that the idea of states having their own prerogatives are like right. such a plus but also a minus, you know, because for the people that make different choices, now it's not universal. Well, I'm happy to hear that someone was from New Jersey. I mentioned before I'm near Pennsylvania, oh, but good. I'm actually in home state, New oh, Jersey. Good. It's I'm great glad. to hear that active work's being done back home. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's definitely working out for you. Um, next, we have Lee Kim, who is the Director of Privacy and Security and the Interim Senior Counsel and Data Protection Officer at HIMSS. Um, Lee, hi. How hi, are you how doing? Are you? Hello. So you are working on security and compliance um, with HIMSS. It's been a big Big topic, um, hearing about that. So, what are you most excited about this year in terms of security? In terms of the industry? Sure. Um, we actually just published our 2019 HIMSS Cybersecurity Survey. Mm -hmm. It's available at www.hims.org slash HIT security. Okay. And what I was most excited to see is um, a real trending with our questions in terms of um, more folks in the healthcare sector adopting best practices and more uniformity, being on the same page, being a, raising their profile, as it were, their baseline in terms of security practices and best and um, you know actually best practices for industry. So that was wonderful to see. We're we're maturing. That's awesome. And what type of work is HIMSS doing to ensure that a focus on privacy and awareness of privacy is infiltrating every corner of healthcare, from ground, bottom level to the ground up to the tech providers to the healthcare providers? Sure. So as a not-for-profit organization, we are connectors and we are also liaisons. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so um, let me, being a, always a transparent person, yeah. let me just say this. So, you know, we are, of course, one of many not-for-profit organizations and others that are helping to raise the roof, so to speak, in terms right. of privacy and cybersecurity. I think we all believe, uh, we all know in our hearts and we all believe that patient privacy is really important. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when you think about cybersecurity, it's not just simply some guy or gal in the back room making sure that you know the computers are secure and everything else. The, uh, cybersecurity folks are essentially in our frontline defense. Yep. Yeah. So what we do as content experts and liaisons is that we connect with individuals from private sector and also government to essentially confer and convene to essentially spark discussion and uh, develop deliverables as well as um, you know gather input and try to connect people so that as a greater whole we can raise the roof as it were in terms of cybersecurity. So in other words, we're trying to make it more co quote, cohesive, more connected, because right now the problem across actually privacy and cybersecurity generally is because there's misinformation, there's disinformation out there, yep. and there's just way too much silo. Right. And HIMS, I mean, this is perfect, right? We're a global company. Yes. We're yes. everywhere. We intend to be everywhere. <laughs> yes, we you intend will. to do great things, yes. right, in the world. And so we are the glue, we are the connectors, we're the conveners. We can't do it all. Yeah. I'm sure that both of you know we, right. we can't do it all. Right. But, but you're doing it. Piece. You're doing great work, and, and we see it here. Lee, thank yes. you so much for being on our thank show. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. I feel like Kim's has like a lot of arms. Oh, absolutely. And right? As we were just saying, it's a global company. We're here in sunny, not so sunny today, but sunny Florida. But and we have had guests that are from across the ocean talking about what their areas are doing. And really, Hims as a company, a nonprofit, is looking not just in the U.S., but across. Right. And, uh, you know, the analytics department, the absolutely. your publications. The, you know, media accounts, too. We like yeah. to think so. I li look, I'm, I happen to be biased towards media myself, <laughs> um, but I think it's all really important. Up next, we have Brian E. Dixon, who is a PhD and FHI MSS research scientist at the Regent Strip Institute. How did I do? Uh, pretty close. <laughs> okay. Regan Street. Thank you. Yeah. Regan Street Institute. <laughs> yeah. um, Brian, tell us a little bit about what you do and what you're looking to find at HIMSS. Sure. So I'm the director of public health informatics at the Regan Street Institute, and so um, I oversee kind of our efforts to try to make uh, intelligent systems for population health. So I'm very interested interested here at HEMS to uh, look at new innovations and meet with partners or potential partners who are interested in working on improving population health using a lot of the newer methods and um, uh, tools and innovations that are coming out of machine learning, computer science, artificial intelligence. So I'm very excited about what I see here. I'm sorry, I was to say population health, to define it, you know, you have patients, you have communities, you have neighborhoods, and this is like massive groups of people and identifying trends. Absolutely, yeah. So we're uh, we're looking at, there, many uh, health systems are interested in defining populations in different ways. So they want to either look at all the people that they manage care for yeah. or all of the people who have a certain type of disease. Yeah. But then we're also uh, working with governmental public health agencies to look at the community level, as you mentioned, or uh, w both at the state health department level or the CDC. We also work at Regan Street with uh, ministries of health in other countries cool. to look at population health in, in that context. That's great. Yeah. And you're describing it as intelligent design for these types of systems. And yep. you mentioned some of the technologies that are going in. Obviously, you work with so many people, so many different populations. There's just a wealth of data. And I assume that automation has to be coming into at least a certain uh, aspect of your design. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. We try to automate as much as possible because we think that automation will reduce burden on providers, so the people who are collecting the data, as well as uh, reducing burden on those who are sort of receiving the data and trying to analyze it. So we're trying to uh, build sort of dashboards that will auto-populate with data that's collected from routine care delivery, as well as pulling in uh, data from other large data sets, so like uh, the American Community Survey or the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System data, um, so that we can automate the delivery of that data into dashboards, which will uh, reduce burden on those who are trying to sort of look at population trends instead of working with individual data sets and trying to mu 
munge and manage right. those individually, right? Yeah. Uh, which is a lot of work, and that's how we did things right. 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, but now we're trying to automate as much as possible end to end and, and connect systems together. You have such a fire hose now of data just <laughs> spewing everywhere. Yeah. What percentage of the data actually ends up not being helpful? Um, well, a fair, a fair amount of it actually ends up not being. There's a lot of noise in the data, and so part of what we try to do it through discovery is find out what signals um, are really important and powerful and can predict outcomes, yep. and then where is the noise? Because there's a, there's a lot of noise, whether it be bad data that's in the systems or whether it be sort of useless variables. So yep. we try to um, eliminate those systematically through our work. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, Brian, keep going. <laughs> Solve the world's problems, and I'll see you in a couple years. All right, thank All right, you very thanks, much. Thank thanks for being Appreciate on the it. show. Great. Um, I do think about how much data now can come through and how do you make sense of it? And I think it's it's really cool finding ways to streamline it. Absolutely, and just bring a little bit back around to what we were talking about maybe close to the beginning of the show. Yeah. Wearables, bringing those into the hospital, that's one of the biggest problems or challenges, I should yeah. say, facing this is just you're walking around, the data is being collected all the time. How do you disseminate what's important and bring it together? And we also had an interview with the Google Cloud, right, and right. how they are taking different systems, you know, whether or not it's mammograms, in uh, EHRs, whatever, and finding ways to do a query and bring in all data from all elements, which I think uh, really specifies on a population. It's exciting. So we're here now with Christina Tagill. Um, Christina, it's nice to meet you. Are you a doctor? Yes, I am. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to me about um, why you've come to HIMSS and what's exciting you about the healthcare landscape now. Well, very in, in, uh, exciting is you know, when old medicine meets new technology, and I think that's what we can hear, see at HIMSS. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of new things going on, and the shift is really coming now, so that's why I'm here, to, to look around and scout around. We've talked a lot in, um, in our conversations about the whole idea of patient first, which you know firsthand. Um, but we feel like that, that definition has come up in three different ways, right? That you engage the patient, to do what they're supposed to do to try to get better. Um, you engage the patient as a person with care and compassion and empathy, and then the patient gets engaged as a consumer who starts to make choices. Where does your interest fall when you think about the patient? Well, I think it's very important that they know what we want them to know, mm -hmm. because uh, patients today, they go out and they Google, mm -hmm. and they get scared. Yeah. So if they come to our department, I think they should know what we would like to teach them about their diseases. So I think that's a very, very important thing to do, and also get their feedback, what they think about our treatment and questions directly to us, instead of, go, instead of going out and look for it. Right. Mm -hmm. Can you describe a little bit the direct interface that patients are interacting with your company? Is it an app? Or is it another yes. service? Yes. Well, it started. I started this about 20 years ago, looking with machine learning and and. Um uh, medical images, and uh, that has now continued in uh, empowering the patients with also information about the disease. Exploding, right? Yes. <laughs> it is, it is, yeah, yeah. And also giving, uh, I, have, I have a couple of apps, yes, and mm. also uh, told tools for the physicians to use. How do you feel, um, you know, in your mind, um, how much do you feel a patient can take control of their own health and heal? through information? I think a lot more than we think, than yeah. we believe. Before we took kind of all care of the patient, we didn't ask the patients. Now we should put much more into the patient's decision, I think, because they know their disease. They are sick 365 days a year, and we maybe meet them one, once or twice during that time. Yeah. So we have to engage them, to, to, to them to get better. Right. Yes. Doctor, thank you so much for being on your show. And by the way, I totally agree with you. I think the power of the patient is huge. So Absolutely. good. Enjoy your conference. Thank, thank you very much. Right. Thank you. We are now moving forward to a conversation I was able to have yesterday. Take a look. With me now is Gurpreet Singh, who is the U.S. Health Services sector leader of PricewaterhouseCooper. Um, Gurpreet, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So why are you here? And this is not an existential question, just to be clear, but what is exciting you about the healthcare space? So the, the healthcare space is obviously very exciting for me. Last year when I was here, uh, we were talking a lot about the vertical integration, right? So a lot of the big deals that were announced, like such as such as CVS and Aetna, such as Cigna Express Scripts, such as Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, J.P. Morgan, a lot of big vertical integration deals were announced at that point in time. Yep. Right. So fast forward a year, 
So now, now where are we standing, right? And so many of those deals are starting to cultivate. Uh -huh. They're starting to move forward. Um, but we still have a similar concept and issue that's occurring, right? How are we organizing around the patient as a consumer? Mm -hmm. And how do we provide them with value? How do we provide them with access? How do we provide them with convenience? For these big companies that have come together, and I'm almost going to put into a verb, the Amazoning sure. of, um, of uh, healthcare, right? What are the benefits for them to do that? And what are the obstacles they face now that the patients are becoming consumers? Sure. So one of the things that I think really interesting, maybe just to personalize it a little bit, so my, uh, I have two sons. I have a 15 and 11-year-old. Uh -huh. And my, both of them were at science camp you know, over the summer and they were staying in the dorm, and we got a phone call from the school, and they said, well, your 11-year-old, we think, has a broken wrist. And so we said, okay. First question we asked was, how, how, does, how does an 11-year-old get a broken wrist at science camp? Yeah. Right? The second question we asked was, okay, well, how do we quickly triage whether this is truly a broken wrist or not? Huh? Right? And so we drive up, I live in Chicago, so we drive up, uh, up north to the school that they're at, and we quickly take them to a urgent care clinic, mm -hmm. right? Because we're maximizing access and we're maximizing convenience, huh? right? Now I have friends that, that are, you know, at Northwestern University and University of Chicago and they're physicians that are very well, very well renowned, yep. right? And so of course, I, after I get the image, I text them the image and do a little do-it-yourself healthcare, right. if right. you will, Proactive DIY patient, healthcare. Right, caregiver. Um, and, uh, you know, they give me their quick recommendation. It looks like it's you know, a clean break, you might need to get it reduced, but probably the most convenient approach is to take them to a bone clinic that's maybe five miles away from where you are at the urgent care clinic. Yeah. And within maybe 30 to 45 minutes, they've reduced the fracture, they put him in a cast and he's back at school. Uh, so what's just happened there? Yeah. The funds flow has completely changed, yeah. right? It's moved away from the, the ER at, the, at those hospitals and it's moved more towards those consumer facing. It's funny because somebody said to me, you know, here we come, everyone's talking about, ooh, the silver tsunami, it's so yeah. crazy, you know? It, yep. But that once that wave comes through, that the younger generation may just be like, I'm done with you, big hospital system. Right. 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 And, and maybe that's the, the place where things really begin to change. That's right. So we just recently wrote uh, an article on the top trends for healthcare. Okay. And one of those trends that we talk about is the emergence of the Southwest Airlines of healthcare. Wow. And so while we don't have one today, yeah. you can start to think about what does is, what is Southwest do yeah. in their context, right? right? First, number one is they're operationally efficient. Yep. Right. They're very good at maximizing Quick their turnover. planes, their turnover, yep. their processes. They're very good at, at the operational efficiency and they've built their business off of that. Number two is their customer intimate. They know their customers well. They know the routes that they go on. If they have routes that have too much capacity, they'll immediately send a social, social media approach to actually getting them maybe a cheaper flight yeah. and, and do a promotion and maybe change the rate structure yeah. you know, on demand so that they can actually maximize that capacity. So you can start to look at that analog, if you will, and start to apply it to healthcare. In all dimensions In of health, dimensions. I mean, even yeah. patient engagement, right? The it. difference between sending a text message to an 85-year-old yep. and a 15-year-old. You got it, right? you got Actually, it. somebody told me um, while they were treating in telehealth, mm -hmm. one reason why it was working was because the 15-year-old loved looking at themselves yeah. while right. they were doing the physical therapy. Yeah. You could see her eyes going, yeah, it's great. <laughs> you know, and it is that whole way of, of thinking. Yeah, and so. we've, we've, uh, we've done some research and we found that, that actually 75% um, of patients or consumers actually want to receive treatment yeah. via digital means. Yeah, wow. And actually on the flip side, 70, also 75% of physicians are willing to take data, whether it's from a phone, like a picture of you know, maybe your ear yeah. or a picture like if let's say you had an otoscope, yeah. like to actually use that as part of that, their diagnosis. Right. And so right. we're seeing both on the consumer side and on the caregiver side, that there's an emergence of wanting to use these new tools yeah, and, and, and collaborate. And collaborate. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Repeat. We could talk for a long time. We could. But I'm shutting you down right now. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks. the time. Thanks a lot. We're joined now with Maury Greenberger, MPPA Director of the Informatics Office of the CTIO at HIMSS. Maury, I'm excited to have you here because we've been talking about a lot of kind of the buzzwords, AI, interoperability, but blockchain is one that uh, I think we need more. So start with the 101. Sure, so blockchain in general is 
your worst kind of database, right? It's a decentralized distributed ledger technology. So there is uh, no one one database that houses all of the information. It allows to have information more or less be held at different nodes. It's uh, federal, it's federated, yep. right? So it's not centralized. And it really uh, is, it is a type of distributed ledger technology, which I alluded to. And it's a technology that is not uh, immature. It is more, uh, it's been utilized more in the financial arena, other industries outside of healthcare. It is newer to healthcare space. Uh, some would argue that it's nascent, if you will, um, and it's one actually that's newer to him, so it's, it's only a couple years old. Mm -hmm. hmm, very interesting. And following up on that, yeah. blockchain is new yep. to HIMSS. Mm -hmm. How has uh, the sort of advocacy and utilization of blockchain within the HIMSS membership evolved over the last couple of years? Yeah, absolutely. So really about a year and a half ago, uh, we started, like many of us in the industry, you know, started hearing more about this blockchain technology. And, you know, it's certainly, uh, I would say in 2018 sort of, was at the hype, right, of it. And I know um, as 2018 sort of came and went, there was a bit of a boom as it related to Bitcoin and people thinking that blockchain was just Bitcoin and crypto. And that is not true, right? So we had to understand and sort of unpack that and do our due diligence and really think about what the potential impact of the technology, the blockchain technology piece, separate from crypto, and really just understanding the potential impact it could have mm. and its role in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So, yes. oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, so specifically yeah. Yeah. in the role of healthcare, yeah. um, what does blockchain mean to a provider versus a payer? Like, how, how are there different feelings about it? Right, absolutely. So, uh, there, as we know, HIMSS is filled with every different stakeholder setting type. So, it, within HIMSS, we did stand up a task force, right? And so within that task force, we, we really made sure to bring in the provider, the payer, the academic, you know, the academic institution, the financial um, institution. And at the end of the day, what it, what it really comes down to in thinking about blockchain technology, it is a tool, it is not a goal, mm -hmm. right? You need to understand the problem you're trying to solve, you need to rally around a use case, mm -hmm. and then once you understand what that use case is, thinking about the right players that need to come to the table. Could be a provider, could be a payer, it, you know, it, it, it really, it just all depends on what you're trying to solve. So that all being said, there have been some really exciting uh, pilots that are, have gone now into commercial implementation. For instance, the Synaptic Health Alliance um, has several members, including Quest Diagnostics, Humana, Optum, Ascension Health, I mean, really, and they're, um, they're trying to solve provider directory management. Right. Not really sexy, but it's a major issue. And super important. It's super important. Right. And there is a lot of cost, right? And time and sunk cost, most right. importantly. Right. Um, and, and blockchain technology as a tool can help to rid that redundancy and the time um, and, of, of course, the money right. uh, that it takes to to solve these kinds of problems. So and I feel like you start that process to, you know, and even though it's hard in the beginning, at the yes. end it really, really helps. Totally. It's Mari. all about trust and building that consortia. Awesome. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here. Thanks. So one of the big theses for me, you know, as a former operator who turned investor, you know, is it really is about the customer, right, and about finding product market fit. And so that's always what we look for, whether it's good times or bad. You know, we're interested in companies that really deliver value to their customers, really understand their customers well enough that they can build a product that, that fits a burning cu customer unmet need. You know, and I think that's especially true if market conditions get a little worse. You know, in, in an environment like today, you know, companies are willing to spend a little more if their employers, you know, uh, 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 consumers are willing to spend a little more, um, but in, in times where it gets a little tighter, then real hard ROI and, and really making sure that it's a burning customer need becomes critically important. And so that's what we look for macro, uh, from a macro perspective. West, technology-enabled solutions that move your communications into the future. 
patient engagement solutions that support you in solving the complex communication challenges associated with patient experience, patient care, patient access, and revenue cycle management. Digital media solutions that help you target the right audience, communicate across multiple channels, and monitor the impact of your messages. Visit us in Booth 659. With us now is Michael Archuleta, who's an MBA and a Chief Information Officer at the Mount San Rafael Hospital, which is part of the Bridge Care Health Network. We're happy to have you here. Um, well, thank you. As somebody who um, works at a high-level position at a hospital, you have to make a number of decisions um, about uh, numerous methodologies. What is your number one focus right now? My number one focus, of course, is, and I think coming to HIMSS, we've been focusing a lot on, okay, what's cybersecurity? What does that mean to an organization? I think organizations have a cultural issue when it comes to cybersecurity. I like to really focus on, let's change the culture of the organization to understand the importance of what cybersecurity basically brings to the organization. Individuals at times when you're basically speaking to the board of directors or the additional C-level individuals, they understand operational, financial, and reputational standpoints. They don't understand cybersecurity, they don't understand uh, system mitigation, they don't understand those type of terminologies. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is cybersecurity is a matter of life and death. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is, we hear about ransomware kind of going out, being really a major issue in healthcare organizations, right? And that is a problem, don't get me wrong. When specific ransomware comes to, into an organization, it really disrupts the overall process, the org locks out files, etc. But imagine, some organizations aren't really focusing on the medical devices, on what do you have on your network that can be a threat to your organization? So now, hackers are basically looking at targeting medical devices, which then, of course, if you have an IV pump attached to an actual patient, that IV pump becomes hacked. Mm -hmm. That becomes a life or death situation moving forward. Right. And if you look at some of the medical device industries that are mandated and basically followed by the FDA, 43% of those specific organizations have stated that they have a cybersecurity issue. Wow. And if you look at the pacemaker software alone, there was 8,000 security security flaws associated with that alone. And so hospitals have actually paid ransom to get data back. And hospitals or, have paid ransom yeah. to get data back. And high officials have also removed implants that have an associated IP address to basically not be in part of that area of saying, hey, can the heart be hacked? Yes, it can oh be. Oh my God. That is a major problem. I remember that was a story about Dick Cheney a few years ago. It was. It wow. Was. Really? But, yeah. <laughs> wow. but the question I've always wanted is, has it happened? Happened. Has uh, someone been uh, killed or injured by a hacked medical device yet, an infusion pump or a pacemaker? Or are we still kind of saying it's just a matter of time? It's just a matter of time right now. Mm -hmm. If you look at some of the actual stats out there right now, so the FDA knows that they have an actual issue. So recently, the FDA, and it was like late 2018, signed an actual addendum with the Department of Homeland Security mm -hmm. to create their first cybersecurity framework to incorporate it into the medical device industry. So it's not that it has happened, but of course we always say it's not if, right. but it's when. It's a matter of when. And that That's becomes right. the actual problem. What is the um, biggest barrier to entry for people doing this uh, you, in terms of actually really addressing the cybersecurity issue? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the barriers right now that I see a lot of organizations basically failing to at times is if you look at Biomed, Biomed has been focused completely on medical devices, right? But who does Biomed answer to? Most of the times in organizations, they answer to the facilities director. So can you really tell yourself that you have a total count of medical devices in your organization, and can you tell me that those specific devices are fully patched and have no type of security vulnerability attached to? You cannot say that. Mm -hmm. And if Biomed is answering to facilities, that becomes a major problem. So Biomed has to move forward into 
the overall IT aspect of the department chain, really focusing on the actual initiatives of what we do. And some problems that I'm seeing too with the Internet of Things, the Internet of Medical Devices, is really having an overall Hawkeye view of what do I have in my environment? Right. What has a specific IP address? We know if you look at like telemetry systems or any of those additional devices, they're always built on an isolated network. Right. So it's really hard to kind of determine, can I see a full inventory of that isolation? Wow. And with new technology out there and with the utilization of artificial intelligence and predictive analytics, you can really improve on those aspects. And what we're doing as an FYI is we are using predictive analytics to look at abnormalities within our actual network environment. And we're doing user behavior analysis, correct, and hardware analysis to determine is this how this specific piece of machine should act in the actual environment itself? So now we're creating visibility, which really creates better strategies in moving forward with your cybersecurity initiatives. Well, that is certainly eye-opening, so thank you very much for uh, giving us that view. It's a really interesting perspective. I really appreciate it, Michael. Thanks hey, for being well, on the show. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yes, it is a very exciting time. Uh, we are a cloud-based workflow orchestration platform, and our primary focus is to support our clients in helping to bring together unstructured workflows. Our goal is to not only provide support in their existing environment, but also help to recoup costs that may be spinning out of the business because of disparate systems, legacy applications, workflows that generally have not been aligned or orchestrated across the platform. awarded a, a Davies Award this week uh, here at Hims 19. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you were nominated, what the award is being given for, and uh, what that process has been like? So we're extremely excited about it. So it's a prestigious prize, but it's, to us it's all about how we use technology and data to drive patient improvement and patient care, right? So that patient outcomes are critical, and how you how you sort of use technology and, and data to support the clinicians to drive. Uh, our stories, Davies stories, are not IT stories. They're really clinical stories. Mm. This is our clini clinicians innovating within our EMR and technology more broadly to drive this, the changes that they want to see for their patients. Uh, you know, in fact, we're starting to see our EMR as a clinical innovation platform where clinicians are actually driving change. It is, they, it is them who want to sort of improve how they care for their patients and they're using technology and data to drive that improvement. So bringing together all of these physicians is huge and they're all coming together and you're really creating kind of a culture of data. So can you tell me a little bit more about that? So yes, absolutely. We, we love data. Uh, we've been dri data drives a lot of transfer trans transparency. Uh, and uh, and decisions as decisions well. Decisions and accountability uh, at, at all levels of the organization. We've been uh, radically transparent in certain areas of our business where we are freely share data. We do share data across our institutions. And, uh, and we make sure that everybody has access to it and can see it. And, and we, you know, this really starts to drive accountability and real change within the organization. We would like to see ourselves continue to move in that direction and really you know, strive to become a data-driven organization. Yeah, and what I love too is the idea of finding a way that physicians um, can participate in the data, not resent the data, right? It's not too much, yeah. it actually works in your favor and then end up actually moving great health forward. Our physicians are clamoring to get more data. Yeah, they want to see data. They're very much invested in improving patient outcomes. And the only way to do that in the mental health environment, the really way to transform it, is through data, we believe. Last 10 seconds. Um, you are one of the few people that have come up uh, the MRAM scale and been wildly successful. How does it feel to be that high? Uh, you know what? It only feels like we're at the beginning. Oh. It only feels like we've put in <laughs> building blocks. Yeah. And now the real fun begins. When you start looking at the data integration, when you start to have you know, clinicians come to you and say, we want to drive this using the data and using the EMR. No, but, but it is building blocks and yeah. necessary, but that's the, the fun begins now. That's right. Damien, thank you so much for joining us and congratulations on your award. Right. Thank you very thank much. You. Really thank appreciate you. it. We are transforming lab testing by building a world where everyone can access affordable, insightful, and life-changing lab tests. Um, I got started uh, founding the company in 2015, and what I've loved about being a digital health founder is that we can really move quickly with technology that is readily available in other industries. Um, 
um, like with groceries or mattresses or other commodities and be able to bring that to healthcare to make the patient and the consumer experience significantly better. Um, and specifically for us in the lab testing space, we use technology to make testing convenient, affordable, transparent, and fast. And I think all of those things before bringing kind of technology to bear have just been unavailable for the patient experience and lab testing. And that's why um, we've just been so excited about what we've been able to build over the last three years at Everly Well. And in the next three years, what we're looking to do is become a household name and a mass market brand and create a world where people can get a vitamin D test when they buy a supplement or they can get an HIV test, um, direct Amazon Prime to their house and get results in three days and just make a product that is accessible where people live and work, but also used in concert with their doctor so that they are better able to monitor their levels, monitor their data, and then have a better and more comprehensive healthcare experience. With me now is Vic Nagji, who is a CTO for Managed Services at Sirius, as well as the Chief Enterprise Architect as an advisor for the Cleveland Clinic. Vic, I'm sure you've been rocketing around this conference with a lot to look at. What would you say has been kind of the most interesting to you? So uh, one of the most interesting things for me at the HIMSS conference is just uh, networking, reconnecting with a lot of, uh, A, reconnecting with a lot of uh, old colleagues. How and, appropriate, and you know, meeting, pun yeah, included. Exactly, exactly, pun included, <laughs> uh, intended. And so, um, you know, so that's, so that's one of the biggest things. And I, I think that uh, this year, more than any, any others, uh, there's some real meat behind some infrastructure and technology uh, topics. Mm -hmm. For example, cloud is a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's real. It's to say, uh, you know, I know you had Mike previously from Satara. They're doing some amazing things in the cloud um, over the Cleveland Clinic. We're doing some stuff with the cloud as well. Why do you think for the past couple of years it's been a little shakier? Oh, goodness. You're going to get me in trouble for this one. <laughs> uh, you know, I think there's a couple different reasons. So um, healthcare practitioners from the IT side, so CIO, CTOs, they, they by design and nature have to be a little bit risk averse. They have to be, you know, Especially they keep the lights data. on. Absolutely, right. you gotta keep the lights on. You can't mess around with any of that because bad things start to happen. Um, the, the other aspect too, uh, the associate CIO at, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic uh, has this really amazing saying, Matt Call is his name, really amazing saying. He talks a little bit about the parallels between the financial services industry mm. and healthcare. Mm. And the secret sauce about the financial services industry is that every single system that's built is independent and decoupled from the other. So for example, your ATM system is different from your online banking system. Wow. This is different from your brick and mortar system. So if one of them fails, eh, it's inconvenient. You, you make the press, yes, that's bad news, but, but it's not catastrophic. Now you go over to healthcare, you can't do that because they're all sort of working together. And right? actually trying even more and more. It's getting more and more complicated exactly. as they connect. Exactly. So, so there's a little bit of risk aversion there. Uh, I think the second part too is that some of these applications that we're working on that we run in healthcare that have been running for quite a while aren't very well architected or suited mm -hmm. and somewhat by design. Uh, cloud didn't exist when they were built, right? Um, there's a lot of locality. There's a brick and mortar aspect of it. You're, you go to the hospital, you sit there and then there's physicians and nurses and caregivers and so some of these applications just aren't built for the cloud and so we're seeing a lot of you know so we're learning from other industries so there's a lot of SaaS first now there's a lot of hosting opportunities there's a lot of managed services that are coming into play and then there's also a lot of hmm I wonder if there's certain components of our infrastructure that we could simplify by leveraging parts of the cloud. So hybrid is huge um, in, in healthcare. That's why I think we're seeing a lot more now. I also am kind of encouraged by what you're saying because I feel like when EHRs came in into play, um, there was sort of a rush, right? So you hear about how EHRs could have been so much better, how there are too many clicks, not enough good UI. Um, here we are again on kind of the second phase of the cloud, initially starting a little I don't know, primordially or awkwardly or whatnot, and that maybe after all of this, someone's saying, hold on, let's move forward with technology in a way where we put SaaS first, right? Let's reverse the order so that we end up building it right. Do you believe that that uh, might be a place where things are going to pivot in terms of things getting easier? Uh, 
yes, for for several applications, I do believe that that's that's the case. Um, I, I hesitate a little bit in terms of unequivocally saying yes. I know because, rash generalizations <laughs> are really hard, yeah, right? And not fair. And, and that's okay. Uh, it's just uh, it's just around. You know, there are still a lot of. And I come back to this whole physical aspect because there's such a physicality about healthcare. Yeah. There's things attached to you. There's things that are talking to other systems that are attached to other systems that are sitting next to you, right? So there's this, this whole aspect. So long story short, there's some applications that are, in my opinion, yeah. going to stay on premises yeah. uh, regardless of what we do. I think our uh, charge and, and our charter, really, as, as good stewards of, uh, of uh, 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 money for healthcare organizations yep. and also to drive better patient outcomes, uh, is how can you take technology and use it and abuse it appropriately mm -hmm. to get the best out of uh, your investment, maximize your investment, yep. but simplify, yep. massively simplify. And right. I think that's where the hybrid strategy and leveraging cloud is really going to pay off. Well, I can't wait to see you at HIMSS 20 and you can tell me how it worked. Vic, okay. thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. We're focused on digitally detecting developing diseases. Uh, main catalyst for the company, um, it took me from spending my life in uh, life sciences academically, professionally as a healthcare investment banker for over a decade, and then the very personal experience caused me to come full circle and actually um, work on an innovative solution to. Hi, I'm here with Dr. Josh Newman, Chief Medical Officer of Salesforce. Dr. Newman, welcome. Thank you for having me. So here at HIMSS 19, what is Salesforce's overarching mission? I understand that you released some new products. Can you tell us about those? The overarching mission is to enable the relationships between organizations and people. In the case of HIMSS, it's about patients, it's about members, sometimes it's about partners and physicians. The way we're doing it this year is our newest innovations in Health Cloud, which is a product that we released three years ago. We release three times a year. This year we're announcing social determinants of health, scheduling for home health, which we call field service, and marketing journeys that enable tailored journeys for people and campaigns to communicate with them. Social determinants of health is just everywhere at HIMSS. We're hearing all about it this year, and we, we hear about it every year, but each year we've heard more, and it's kind of at a fever pitch this year. So what, tell us about the social determinants of health technology there. It's a concept that comes from health services research, and it's been known for more than a decade. What's great is that it's finally really percolating down into the giving of healthcare. It comes from anal analysis and analytics that shows that if people have the same disease and they get the same interventions, they can still have wildly divergent outcomes. Why is that? Some people have, best, have good follow-up, some people have the resources to take care of themselves, right. and some people don't have any of that. And so we can surface those data by looking at the social determinants, things like, do you have transportation? Do you have food? Do you have the resources to take care of yourself, to fill your prescriptions? Do you have the psychological well-being that enables you to follow with a care plan and take your medicines on time? Surfacing those gaps is the first piece. Bridging those gaps is the second piece. On Salesforce Health Cloud, what we're doing is we're showing people how to do those things, how to gather the information, and then making it actionable. So you talked about the data and the analytics, and there are a lot of technology vendors that are going after social determinants of health. I'm sure you've seen Epic CEO Judy Faulkner say she wants to rename the EHR, Comprehensive Health Record, for the sake of getting more types of data in there, notably social determinants. So not just Salesforce, but relative to the broad set of technologies that are being applied to those, what can they do? Most importantly is to, is to gather the data and surface it and show the clinicians. So we commend Epic in their, uh, in their interest and their support of this. The next step, however, is to try and bridge those gaps. How do you do that? You need to connect with social service providers. You need to connect with all kinds of other technologies that might enable you to bridge those gaps, to help someone get a ride, to help someone with some food assistance. And that's the kind of stuff that Salesforce uh, excels with. So when we started this conversation, that's kind of a final question for you here. You, know, you mentioned that every year Salesforce brings forth three new capabilities. And, and you uh, three times a year, actually. Three so times nine a year. times a year. So <laughs> what's next? 
Uh, I think we're finding more integration between all of our products. We have products that support marketing and sales, which is enrollment, service, which is connecting to people once they leave the hospital, and engagement, mobile apps. We're seeing that entire journey become more and more important to our customers. And as our customers start knitting those pieces together, they're finding the benefit of really building relationships with their patients, their members, their partners, and even the physicians they employ. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time here. Dr. Thanks Newman. for having me. Appreciate Tom. it. Jonah and I are joined with, by David Harlow, who is an attorney and consultant at the Harlow Group. David blogs at healthblog.com, and that's spelled health, B-L-A-W-G.com. David, we're really happy to have you here, and I think that uh, we have a very interesting conversation to be had about the whole world um, and you being aware of the digital revolution um, and how there are enormous benefits to that. But by being digital, um, what happens to the human touch? So what have you been thinking about with that quandary? Sure. Well, I've been a healthcare lawyer for over 30 years, and the past 10 years or so, I've really been focused in the digital health space. And at the start of this era, there was really a focus on really going all out with the digital tools. And I think now we're retrenching a little bit and understanding that not everything can be delegated to the digital uh, space and we need to have human interaction. It's still a very important part of healthcare as in other parts of human endeavor. So we really need to find the perfect balance. How do we, how do we reach the right balance? What's the right mix of digital and human? And of course, the promise of digital is always scale, right? And once That's you right. reintroduce the human element, then you have to make sure you can still maintain those benefits of scale that having an app gives you. I mean, how do you tackle That's that? That's right, challenge of uh, what people call uh, wetware, us uh, humans, right? <laughs> and uh, the question is really, how do you build in some, some rules, some approaches that can be leveraged by a human workforce and communicated to patients, communicated communicated to caregivers, communicated to clinicians in a way that allows tools to scale. And again, that's really the search that's that's on for that for that mix. Right. We can use the analytic tools that we have at our disposal now in order to surface appropriate recommendations for clinicians or caregivers, you know, right person, right place, right time kind of solutions right. and then enable individuals to deliver that sort of last mile. You know, um, a quick anecdote is I taught a video production class of a high school and they had no rules on iPhones and I asked them to put down their iPhones when they came into class and I had seen online that one reason why is because before the class, when you're waiting for the class to start, that's when relationships are built and how hard it was for them to do that, you know, but what do you learn in terms of one-on-one -on -one get togethers and the power of community? And I do feel like even with digital technology, there is a pendulum swinging back a little bit about the importance of community. Do you see that in your work? Sure. Well, my my community and uh, my many tribes that I belong to huh. are initially digital tribes. Yeah. There are a lot of people who I've met online before I've ever met in person as I've become more involved in the uh, digital health and health IT space over the past decade or so. And uh, my kids, when they were younger, always said, when I tell them don't connect with someone online who they don't know in person, yeah. they say, well, Dad, yeah, look they, at what, you're what about doing. you? Do you feel the bonds that you've had from those people in those communities have um, been legitimate enough and felt real despite the fact you may have never met? Yeah, so when I meet people for the first time in real life, they are really old friends, yeah, right. which is a, an unusual thing, still trying to wrap my head around yeah, it. Right. But the, point, the broader point there is that you can build real human relationships through digital tools, and the question is how do we leverage that in a way so, is that, so that it can be authentic, it can be human, and it can deliver real value in a clinical sense uh, as well as a human sense. Yes. Can we have an example, kind of make this a little more concrete? Sure. Uh, one of the companies I deal with, just as an example, uh, provides services through an app, through a website, but an integral part of the suite of services is provided by a team of human care navigators mm -hmm. who have access to the information of the patients on the app mm -hmm. and are in contact and available by telephone, by text message, whatever the individual wants to use as the way of communicating. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a person. It's a, it's a care 
care navigator, it could be a nurse case manager or a non-clinical person who is doing that, but the work that they are doing is enhanced, is made more precise, is made more relevant, is made more timely by the technical underpinnings. Right. And that's the way in which it can scale, because right. otherwise you have the potential for a lot of lost effort, misplaced effort. Sure. You don't want to do the same thing for everybody, right? right? Whether it's a, a reminder of a certain sort or a nudge of a certain sort, right. it's not necessarily right for everybody. I feel, you know, the good news about what you're talking about, it's an important conversation, especially because in the world, world of health, arguably all medical professionals get started to it because they want people to people to be better. David, we really appreciate your time and thank you for being on the show. Thank you. We are joined now by Grace Coravano, who is an MD and the founder of Enlightening Results. We are thrilled to have you here, Grace. Um, Thank my, you for having me. I, we are happy to have you. I especially am happy to have you because I live with MS. I am a patient. I've learned so much about the system and how complicated it can be. And my understanding is your company advocates for patients. I want to right. talk to you a little bit about um, what you do and why that's important. Yes, thank you. So I can appreciate where you're coming from, and it's something that I'm very passionate about. So my day-to-day -day is working with patients as they navigate the healthcare system and their diagnosis. I work with patients and their care partners from point of diagnosis through survivorship or end-of-life care planning, understanding what their challenges are at any moment in their healthcare trajectory and meeting those needs so they can focus on what's most important, which is really their well-being and their care. Healing, right. Why is the role of patient advocacy emerging in today's healthcare market? This is uh, not a role that was spoken of much maybe even 10 years ago, but now it's becoming a huge part of the uh, industry's discussion. Why, why, why now? Sure, yeah, it's an excellent question. I agree. It's so complicated. So I had a, I had a health scare years ago. I was diagnosed with advanced lymphoma, and uh, I couldn't coordinate my care. I have a PhD in biochemistry. I speak English. I had the financial means. I worked a few blocks from an, a center of excellence, and it brought me to my knees. And if I couldn't do it, how does everyone else manage uh, with the limited resources and knowledge that they have. Um, I advocate for people in trying to connect them to the most important information and tools. And as we're seeing this advent of internet of things and digitization of the patient experience, I feel so passionate about connecting people mm -hmm. to these technologies. So we're not just focused on a clinical outcomes, but life with a diagnosis and making that life a, a, a quality of life. Sure. Uh, we've talked a lot about the way that the healthcare world has started to become a little bit more transparent and honest about each element of uh, healthcare. Uh, has that made it any easier for you as a navigator or advocate? I think patients are, with respect to technology, you bring up an interesting point. The media has been reporting on a lot of transparency, privacy, data, and that goes hand in hand with this digitiza digitization. Yeah. What is happening with my data? I think there's an awareness and a distrust, and we need to do a better job of that. So on top of trying to navigate the complexities of the healthcare system, now there's this added parameter or barrier, which, which I'm concerned about. I, we want patients and their care partners and loved ones to trust healthcare, and we've lost that. So I think there's that need for empathy, rebuilding that trust, and we need to make sure we build empathy into our innovations to be mindful of these needs so we're, no one feels taken advantage of. Right. I, uh, I, I can certainly appreciate also having a new technology and, and wanting it to help you and not necessarily understanding it. For you, who has a, pri and I'm going to call it a privilege, the privilege yes. of holding someone's hand uh, literally and metaphorically over time, um, how have you seen that uh, help with the healing, whether or not there's an official outcome metric that you can talk to, or at least anecdotally, what do you see? Yeah. It is an absolute privilege and a very humbling experience to be welcomed into someone's life when they're in this state of chaos, when they've received an earth-shattering diagnosis. It's not an easy place. Lovely Life is already place. very messy. Yeah. And at a cancer diagnosis or a chronic illness, then it gets complicated. So I, I'm very grateful for that privilege. but. 
what I see there is an opportunity to continue to connect people, connect with information, and there's a severe unmet need there. Yeah. Um, I've taken all of these experiential learnings and, and have committed to becoming what I call a patient experience enhancer, because I see clear unmet needs and opportunities where we can bridge those gaps. Great. Grace, we'll keep doing the amazing work. I know how powerful it is, and I'm sure your constituents feel the same way. Thank you for being on our show. Thank you. Thanks. With me now is Bryce Olson, who is a healthcare strategist at Intel and also somebody I've gotten to meet before as a result of having an incredible uh, personal story. Bryce, tell me about what happened to you and where you are today. Yeah, so I got diagnosed with super aggressive metastatic prostate cancer back in 2014, some of the most aggressive cancers my doctors had ever seen. And, you know, I went through that one size fits all. Everybody gets the same trial and error you know, volume-based care paradigm we're in today, and it didn't work. You know, it's that doctor's attempt to cut, burn, poison, starve cancer out of you, and I got a little bit of mileage out of it, but it ultimately didn't work. Yeah. And by early 2015, my cancer was growing again. I had probably a median survival of about 21 months, according to stats that were produced for guys whose Clinical cancer- Clinical data. Yeah, guys whose cancer has progressed off of chemo, you know, with metastatic disease in the bone, 21 months. So I, I honestly started to lose hope. I didn't think I'd see my kid get out of elementary school, and uh, I, got, I went to a pretty dark place. And, uh, and then how did you take that into your own hands to change the course of yeah, your Yeah, so I got really lucky. So I work for a company, Intel. Um, they have a number of folks that are using Intel technology to try to help the healthcare industry make really cool transformations. I didn't know much about what they were doing, but I was in the company long enough, and I wanted my last days to matter. I wanted to do something in healthcare. So I pushed my way in, and then it blew my mind because I learned all about genomics mm -hmm. and precision medicine and how they were helping cancer researchers understand what was driving disease at a molecular level in the human genome and then using that to target and create new drugs that could actually shut it down. And once I learned about all the companies we were working with, yeah. I said, holy crap, we got to do this for me. Like, why can't we do this for me? So I went in to my pathologist because I knew that the path to precision medicine started with pathology after learning all this. And I just had two words for him. I said, sequence me. And so he sequenced my tumor. We found out that I had a clinically actionable set of mutations yeah. that opened up the door for me to get on a very early phase drug trial, and then I shut it down. For like, Save, which like, saved your life. Saved my life. Saved and life. so I've been a huge advocate of genomics-guided precision medicine and doing whatever I can to wake up as many cancer patients as possible to do what I did. Right. Um, the, your story is so interesting at HIMSS, especially this year, because I think everyone has started talking about precision medicine. And and the, the amazing possibilities of it and how it actually could redefine how you actually diagnose cancer. It's no longer about where it is. It's yeah. like who you are. I think that's very uh, scary for people to think that you're going to throw the framework out by, you know, baby of the bathwater. But the other thing that I think is important here is the whole concept of patient empowerment. Yes. So when you talk about your dark place, the loneliest place you yeah. were, the catalyst of changing it and moving it forward. When you talk to other patients now, what is it that you tell them in the face of their own health? Yeah, so I, I truly believe with all of my heart that data can empower you. Yeah. And when you just go through the one-size-fits-all standard of care and you're just like everybody else, I, I don't know how that really can empower you. And I honestly feel that if you're just doing that, then you've got this paternalistic relationship with the doctor, where the doctor's here and you're here and you're going to do what you're what's told. Right. He's doing the best, or she, doing the best that they can, that they can with what they know. With what they know. And with the time they have. With the time they have. But... There's answers in the data. Right. We just need to get to that. Right. And so genomic sequencing can open a door to a new way to fight. And once you have that done, once you have your own personal diagnostics done to understand what's driving your disease, yeah. that having that insight empowers you like nothing else. Yeah. Because now I feel like, okay, I know what's driving my disease. I don't want to just have the tiny little bit of tools that are in your standard of care tool belt. Let's open up clinical trials. Let's open up off-label right. drugs. And, it, I felt, and see what happens. Yeah, I felt incredibly empowered. So, Bryce, uh, you happen to work at a massive technology company that could support this. For people that are actually watching, what is your advice for them on how to take the first step to yeah, do this? I'm glad you asked. So I started a, a site, a website called sequenceme.org. 
Um, okay. And uh, it's real. We really on that site. It's meant to really do two things. It's like okay, we're selling the shirt, so you can buy the shirt, you can wear the shirt to your doctor's office, and then you can demand sequencing. Mm -hmm. And we provide a battle card for patients who want to know how to go in and have a how dialogue yeah. with a doctor and you know overcome objections if the doctor has it. We've got a Q and A on what this all means. And uh, I mean, that's one thing that I would recommend is just learn about this, get educated, and uh, come check it out. Great. It is so great to see you, Bryce. It's great to see you. Congratulations on your continued healing. Thank it's you. awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Stephen and I are joined by Donna Peters, who is a BS MBA director of the Application Solutions Center Information Systems of TriHealth, and Lori Baker, who is an MSW, who is the director of Senior Health Post Acute Network, at, also at the TriHealth Hospital System. You two, thank you for joining us. Um, we've heard a ton of different themes happening at this conference, and one uh, thing that people continually talk about is, quote, the silver tsunami, um, the aging population, the enormous amount of them, um, the problem problems they have, the comorbidities, et cetera. You both treat the elderly population. Talk to me a little bit about what you see and, and what the issues are. Well, I would say from our perspective, with our seniors program with TriHealth, we've really looked at the aging population from several different angles. We have what we call our Go-Go's, and we have a healthy wellness program. We provide educational events for them, and we provide travel uh, opportunities so that they have a feeling of being with other people mm -hmm. and promoting that healthy wellness and population okay. health. Which is so po important yeah, with right. loneliness being a major proponent to issues yeah. with older people. Absolutely. Yes. And then we also have our, for our aging population, we have some of our other senior programs where we help in the post-acute. But in regards to how the market is changing and looking at aging, we've seen our aging population really embracing digital technology. Mm. We have a lot of our classes. Uh, we actually do classes on how to uh, be a part of the digital technology right. world, how to learn how to do Facebook, but then we also have classes where they register online to participate in any of our programs, and we've been very successful and seeing them adapt and really embrace that technology. Yeah. Not everyone, but a lot of people. Sure, absolutely. We have a patient family advisory council where we really talk with them about technology and things like my chart and do you want to use mobile apps and how would you use them and what kinds of things would you like to see? Well, what's the answer you get? Um, you know, a lot of times, um, a lot of, we see a lot of families who are either taking care of uh, their elderly parent, right, or uh, spouses, um, and they, they love it. They come with them with great ideas ideas for how we could, things we've never thought of, you know, um, about notifications, what kind of notifications, how to be a proxy for somebody, um, wayfinding in our facilities, how challenging that can be. Um, and so they, they just have great perspectives on how to do it. We've really found having that advisory council has been so effective for us in getting some feedback and how we can be better. Wow. I know you guys are uh, up set to win a Davies Award this week here at Hymns 19. Yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the award that, uh, you know, what you were given the prize sure. for, the work that you've done, and, uh, and and how that process has been for you? Sure. Do you want to start? Uh, the process has been fantastic. It's been such an exciting year. We're so happy to be here uh, at, at Hymns to, to receive it tonight. Um, it was a lot of work. I think one of the things we talked about is we felt like we were doing great work, but we really weren't advertising, right? We weren't putting ourselves out there, and we really felt like we wanted to do that this year uh, so we came out it was a little nerve-wracking but it was it was a really exciting day I was so happy to talk about Lori's presentation today and the work we've done in the skilled nursing facilities um, it was a, it was a lot of work but it was so worth that we've really enjoyed uh, the experience this year but I'll let Lori talk you want to start a little sure. bit about what you've done with, with this, this myth? so part of what we did is we felt like it was very important to educate our patients and families and also our hospital system about what facilities in our area okay. are showing the best outcomes so so we actually have all of our nursing homes and all of our uh, and all of our home care companies documenting directly on our Epic for every single patient we send them. So we're one of the few in the nation that have the nursing facilities documenting quality and utilization data, so that we can then use that information to determine who is having the best outcomes and taking the best care of our patients. Then what we did is we put a brochure together and we call it our educational tool mm -hmm. that we give to any patient and their family that is needed 
needed to make the decision to go into a nursing facility for rehab to get stronger before they're ready to go home. And they're able to see the facilities that are close to their home. And then on the flip side, they're able to see why these facilities were vetted as the best facilities in the market. Mm -hmm. So in the Cincinnati area, we have over 125 nursing facilities. So we have a lot of bed capacity. And so families have a lot of choices they have to make. And when you're in the hospital, you're very overwhelmed and you don't know what to do. So this helps arm them with some real-time solutions to make some informed decisions. Wow. Well, I don't know if there's a um, age limit or uh, where you get to be called a go-go, but I feel like you <laughs> Um, so congratulations on your award, and thank you for joining Stephen and I on the show. Great, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thanks. Wow, that's a wrap. We hope you've enjoyed the live coverage from Hims 19. Wes is proud to be the technology partner powering Hims TV and the dominant sponsor of the programming extending the reach of the conference globally. Take care.